uh, sorry, it took us a little while to compile everything. Um, it took us a little bit longer to get everything we needed from various people. Um, so one thing we sent you, uh, which we won't discuss, it was uh, Sam's request to see where we are in the financials. Uh, so that what that's attached to this meeting. So you can look at that. Uh, that's not specifically part of the discussion unless somebody wants to bring that up as part of later on during the discussion. Uh, in the presentation, I kept all of the presentation from the last one, but I added those additional slides that y'all wanted to see where we clearly denote what is the, uh, uh, what is the area that is the historic area where, are, where we're developing and also where we are right now with the campus plans. Uh, I'll show those as we go through each of the schools, we talk through each of the schools uh, in a little bit. Uh, then the third thing that we sent you was a new memo that uh, Julian Capata, who's our uh, entitlements uh, expert uh, put together. Um, our consultant for that. And that sort of, you know, through this process, as we've said, the only other school district that we've found so far that's doing historic districts for K-12 schools is Los Angeles Unified. And so we went and we asked them uh, to provide examples of how they have applied and what their best practices have been in the use of historic districts for uh, K-12 schools. So uh, there are some case studies uh, for uh, three of the three of the uh, projects that they've done at LAUSD, that gives us a little bit of guidance if we're going to be following a similar path with historic uh, districts, that it does give us uh, a a potential uh, pathway and best practices uh, for that. So um, I'm not sure how much that will of that of that memo will come up during this meeting because most of that is going to be about longer range campus planning. Uh, and what we do with the CEQA process, uh, but just wanted to put that in your hands as soon as we got that completed. Um, so we could then, Joan, go to public comment. Um, Steve, could you tell us how many we have? Uh, I've received two requests uh, from uh, Nina and Ruth Ann, both to speak on the the memo that you just referenced, Carrie. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. I, what, we say three minutes each? Sure. It's appropriate. Okay. Can you handle that, Steve? Sure. Um, I'll go ahead and time it. And um, I believe the order I received them in would be uh, Nina first, followed by Ruth Ann. Uh, are we, hi, um, are we going to be speaking before we hear this new staff report? Shouldn't we? Uh, the staff report's not going to deal with this memo. Uh, it's only going to deal with the slides that we're going to do, and we're going to do that as part of the discussion. Right, but there's other new information, and I might want to chime in after I see it. Uh, we're, this is your moment to speak as the, on this continued <laughs> item. Okay. All right. Okay. Is my clock ticking now? I'll, I'll start it once you start. Okay. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> All right. I wanted to thank Julian Capata for his clear and comprehensive report on historic districts on school campuses in Los Angeles. When the Conservancy first began engaging with you on historic preservation, we were hoping you would mirror LA's approach in its guidelines and treatment approaches for historic schools. Campus planning here had already progressed when the prospect of analysis of historic resources became part of the playbook. But our neighbor city's guide is relevant to our historic resources in many ways and can help us adapt. The most important thing to understand in, evalu in evaluating change to historic resources is that every site and every grouping is different. Some can handle a lot of change and some are so fragile that a more delicate touch is called for. So let's enter this next, next phase of evaluation with an open mind and take the advice of the National Trust as well on feasibility studies for historic schools, which reminds us to get outside experts not invested in current plans to evaluate with fresh eyes how we may marry modern spaces with historic buildings. So our request remains the same. 
please hold back for um, plans for McKinley and Will Rogers, which will require fresh holistic reevaluation with overall plan plans because of the new information in the HRIs, but move forward with the library renovations with careful consideration of the HRI findings by applying the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, the next speaker is Ruth Ann Lair. Okay, is my audio on? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So I, I too wanted to address the memo that we got from Julian Capata, which was I felt extremely well done, offered a lot of information and a great baseline for us to think about how we address historic resources in our schools. Uh, one important thing that he referenced is the very detailed document, Design Guidelines and Treatment Approaches for Historic Schools, because that takes the Secretary of Interior Standards and applies them system-wide for various improvements, upgrades, and alterations to historic schools for everything from system upgrades to window replacement. And even though it's their document, not our document, I'm wondering whether or not we might address it as a reference guide as we go through our process. Um, I found the analysis of the three case studies to be extremely interesting because it showed the pathway to how we can address historic resources as we continue our planning process. For example, Thomas Jefferson High School, the demolition affected one secondary level and one tertiary level building, leaving the primary contributors to that district intact. And that's a level of analysis we haven't done. It grades the different levels of significance, but certainly they were addressing keeping the primary ones intact. And so that the, they preserve the integrity of the district as a whole. Um, also, the new construction was carefully cited and designed to avoid negative impacts such as on views and was designed in a style that was compatible with the historic buildings which were streamlined modern. So I think that the case studies offer some good precedents for us to think about as we go through our process. And I think we can uh, thank LAUSD, who of course has a huge number of schools. We have many case studies to draw from looking at those schools, but I think it's, it offers a kind of a, a good template for us as we continue our process. So thank you, Julian, and thanks to you for paying attention to that information. Great, thank you very thank much, Ruth Ann and Nina. Uh, Joan, that concludes our public speakers for this evening. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, as I said, most of this is the is what we showed you last time. And, and as you have your discussion, if you need to go back to any of the specific slides, then please let us know. Um, let me do a swap. Okay, hopefully you're seeing the whole thing. Uh, the way I would, uh, I've spoken to Joan about this and, and the way we think we could do the, the conversation most effectively is, uh, is that we sort of talk uh, site by site. Uh, the, the committee has uh, uh, an opportunity to sort of address each site. And whenever you finish with each site, then we'll move on. Um, we, we do have, we are a little limited in our time. So just want to remind everyone to sort of let's keep it moving uh, so that we can get um, through all five sites and have the recommendation from the committee. So um, approve plans, SMS plans, schedule, direction, as we discussed. So John Adams Middle School, these are the two or three new slides. Um, this shows the, uh, the, the area that was laid out and was specified as the historic district uh, by uh, HRG uh, and sort of shows which buildings, which spaces, you know, the interstitial spaces and what the boundary. Um, this shows where the library is and where the library renovation is. It is within the historic district. Uh, the next building would be a re removal of building L, which is not part of the historic district and building a new science and tech building for that, new steam building. Also, we talked about renovations of the courtyard area right in here and in this area with V, U and T. And then the eighth grade courtyard also. 
And then we would do the central quad, which is outside of the historic district, and the cafeteria, which is also outside of the historic district. We believe that would comp would be the uh, sum total of what we would be doing as far as the master plan and what the CEQA would consider uh, for this project. We have limited uh, reduced master plans to be more 10 to 15 years, even though we did a longer lookout. And what we would do for CEQA purposes would be more of a 10 to 15 year look at each of these at each of these sites. Uh, so, Terry, uh, I, could I just ask a quick question, Terry? Yeah. So, just to be clear, I'm I'm just understanding you you've spelled out the the short term the SMS plan, which is confined to the library. Yes. The other projects you were identifying were uh, part of the master plan. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. That is correct. Okay. We had also talked about in the master plan maybe doing a new gymnasium but we're not gonna be including that in our CEQA study at all as far as the master plan. So the CEQA study would basically allow you to move forward with all these phases, but right now we're just talking about phase one. Correct. I, I just have a question. The new um, science buildings, are they one or two stories? It's a two story, it's a planned as a two story building. Uh, we had looked at that, you know, a year and a half ago. Uh, that was part of the recommendations from uh, Berliner uh, Architects for the campus is that we replace the uh, science building, which is not functioning for the school site at all, uh, with a STEAM building that fits the curriculum of the campus. Amy? Yeah. I, I guess I have a Maybe I'm not quite understanding, so forgive me if I'm doing this wrong, but uh, okay, so I see this historic boundary, but we haven't adopted anything that says we have to abide by these historical boundaries. That is correct. They are listed right now as potential uh, historic resources, uh, and as part of the CEQA process, we would align the uh, potential construction with the uh, potential historic district and make determinations based on that. Okay, Julie, so you might be able to say that better than I can say that, so. No, you go ahead and ask your question. I'll so are we ultimately in. deciding then, I guess, so are we ultimately deciding then if we want to move forward, even though, for example, this is, I see it as N, is within the historical boundary. Yes, so the question is at this moment on the table is the SMS project. So for this one, it's the library. Should we continue with design, acknowledging that design will be done with the with historic architects uh, consulting, uh, working with us to make sure we are not impacting the fabric of the building, or if we are, we're doing it under the Secretary of Interior standards. And that will be specified when you go to the board? Yes. Well, so I, I just to move it along, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with it at JAMS um, based on using you know, the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And, um, but I just wanna be clear in terms of um, the future phases, we're not recommending those phases. We're, the recommendation to the board, whatever we come up with right now would be on the SMS projects only. That is correct. It's to continue to de design SMS projects and we will still have not, we'll still go back. You know, we still have the whole open communication and discussions and a lot of community meetings to complete the master plans, to uh, continue to look at the historic resources and to do the CEQA on the master plan. When, what is the timing for the CEQA? Uh, it will be, uh, Julian, do you have that for this one? Jams, if um, we've, we've obviously now we've modified the project description a little bit, but we're thinking that we will have jams uh, available for public review probably early fall because we don't believe that we're gonna, going to need an EIR. If we, during the process, if we find something, obviously that would switch and we would, I would inform uh, Carrie. But right now, we believe that the initial study uh, mitigated negative declaration would be ready by this fall. And then to, to answer, uh, I believe it was Amy's earlier question. 
So the, the CEQA consultants have been tasked with looking at the campus plans as a whole with a project level an evaluation of the SMS projects and then looking programmatically or at a higher level as it were like 20,000 feet at what the potential impacts of the, the rest of the master plan projects would be. Um, if what that does is it allows the board when they have funding or allows the district when they have funding to review the second phase projects against what was evaluated in the EI, in the CEQA document and move forward if it fits within those parameters. If it doesn't, then they would have to redo a CEQA evaluation. But this just it streamlines future entitlement processes. But it doesn't give permission, you know, it doesn't say yeah. that the phase two projects would move forward. It just allows them to when there's funding, when they're designed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Margaret. Yeah, I, I do have a question. Thank you, Jim. Um, a question about um, what is before us tonight. And, and I, I know that it is this consideration of the approved SMS plans and how we uh, view or how we um, what we recommend to um, the Board of Education. Um, I'm wondering if within that within that that recommendation, um, we are going to be addressing at all the um, um, issue of the historic resources inventory, the issue of um, the district of the issues um, that were kind of highlighted in this memo we just received today about uh, the importance of categorizing the resources within an identified district, such as we have at, um, at Lincoln, I mean, at, at Adams, um, primary, secondary, tertiary, um, to assist with, you know, evaluation uh, down the line. So um, I'm one, is that, uh, so, so the, I, I'm, the, I'm really asking what, what are charges in terms of the, um, recommendations that we we make today okay so the recommendation today is should we continue designing the um sms projects uh and with that designing that if it, there is a historical uh potential impact that that would be done along with our historical architecture consultants to make sure that we're doing that appropriately Later on, we will fully more will more fully address the uh, the campus plans, the uh, historical resources, the CEQA process. That's coming later. The urgency to say yes to move forward with the designs is that if we don't go now with the designs, we're going to miss another year with most of these designs. And that's you know we want to start them in, in, around the summer of of twenty three. We already missed summer of 22, so we want to start summer of 23. If we delay another two months, three months, uh, for the most part, our architects have told us we're going to be pushing this for another year to 24. That has both an impact educationally to students, but it also has a monetary impact. I mean, the delay from last year to this year has raised the price of these projects about over, over $10 million. So that's why it's important to keep moving, but you're not saying, yes, we're doing the project yet because the board has, isn't, you know, all they're doing is saying, let's keep designing and let's keep moving forward. Yes, Jill. Um, I, as a person that had four kids go through jams, I know how badly their library needs renovation. And I have, I'm excited about the new program and what's being planned for that. So I would like to move on unless anyone else has a problem with jams. Are we good? Yeah, I agree. Joan, when you say move on, are, are you are you? Well, go no, go to the next school. Go to like, the next. Yeah. Okay. Unless you have more discussion you want about this jams project. Okay. 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 So these are the pictures we already showed you about the Adams. So Grant, uh, here's the boundary uh, of the historic district, um, carved very specifically around certain buildings. Um, and then these two projects, these three projects, or three little projects, 
One of them is uh, the library renovation. I'm pointing with my pen that nobody can see. Uh, one of them is the library renovation, which includes partly a building that's non-historic, but another building that is. And then there uh, is the uh, work on the uh, early childhood, which is in a non-historic building. And then the courtyard, which, you know, is in the middle and has, you know, will be maintained and restored. Um, most of this project is an interiors project, just like the library at John Adams. There are some discussions about some additional openings. So for the most part, uh, historic resources is not concerned uh, in the, as a historic district with what's going on inside the building, but much more about the outside of the building. So the main practice in question is about the openings and wh whether we can do those and how those can be done effectively and not impact the uh, integrity of the historic district. So I have a, I just have a little question about the, um, the TK classroom. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to, so these are, this is in front of the kindergarten or is this kindergarten? Is this the kindergarten wing in the front? Uh, right now, kindergarten runs right along here and then also okay. runs right along here. And so it would be adding these three classrooms as TK because we believe we'll need three TK and four Ks for universal TK at that school. Okay. Here, let me move forward. Okay, just, okay, just to, I need to finish this part of it because these are the other slides you asked for. So these are the things that would get removed, uh, the six portables. Uh, they won't get removed right away, but then we do the field and we do the new uh, building uh, that would be aligned with the others, you know, the, the single story building with the rooftop garden. Uh, and then the next project would potentially remove uh, the modular buildings and part of building uh, B, and then would put in a new classroom building along building B. This is a two-story TK kindergarten elementary classroom. So this would be touching a potential historic uh, resource and one of the contributors. Uh, and we would be assessing this whole question uh, during the uh, CEQA process. But the library, uh, let's see, you're asking a question about TK. Hang on a second, I was just trying to get to the TK section. Um, yeah, it's just taking yeah. these three rooms and making these three rooms and then opening up the outside yard. So we bring TK and kindergarten into the same area. Right now we have preschool on the back of the campus, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it's, I'll go back to a plan so I can point to it. Uh, preschool right now is over here. Yeah. And we want to get them all out front. That also allows for drop-off pickup, you know, early release, all the things, you know, integration of TK and kindergarten better with same play yard. So it's a positive step for early childhood. Gary, can I ask a question? Sure. What, what is um, underneath these proposed TK rooms currently? Uh, underneath? Yeah, what, what is in that area facing Pearl? Oh, oh right now, these are classrooms that are, uh, like this one is used as a uh, crest room, uh, an after school room. This one is used, uh, uh, so like I think two of them are used as crest rooms and those would move to the back building here. And uh, the, we have a little bit of grass here that we take up, but you know, be make, taking this yard, you know, expanding the yard a little bit to go along with the uh, K yard over here. So it brings those all together, but it's like bringing restrooms to the building is a big part of it because for TK, you gotta have restrooms. Um, so is that, is that area what's green, what's public lawn today, is that gonna become enclosed? A little bit of that, yes. And also, is that the location where all the windows were just replaced when we did the, mm -hmm. um, when I say we, yeah. SMMHD just replaced all those windows and what will happen to those? Uh, there, uh, many of the windows remain, but we are looking at doing some garage door openings in that area to sort of open it up and allow for a more indoor outdoor relationship. That's, that's more of an interior renovation, right? It changes the opening, but it once again, this is a non-historic building, but it is something we'd be doing. But it's like a tear down, saw a tear down and start over. Uh, not not now. Uh, yeah, not not in anything in our current master plan would this building be torn down. Okay. Later it's on, in the future, I wouldn't call it an interior might imagine remodel. that, but we don't do that now. Yeah, I wouldn't call it an interior remodel. The reason I'm bringing it up is that obviously I live in Sunset Park, and our kids went to Grant, so I know the school fairly well. Yeah. And, you know, the curb appeal of Grant 
a long pearl, um, I, I would say overall is just important. I won't get into the historic element, but the way those windows were designed when they were replaced, you know, they were to match and, and you know, Grant has a, has a nice facade, right? Yes. And, it, and it's open to the street. It's not like McKinley that's right. behind a chain link fence where people from the street can't see it. It's part of a, an, it's a, it's a true neighborhood school. And that's why, you know, essentially it'd be like changing the front of your house. And I, I, I think that, that why, uh, that's why it's important because okay. I know that there's been changes along the front. Uh, well, good. Uh, we're we're no, listening I, to you and also our architect is here listening to you as they say that and our historian. No, I, I agree. I think it'll be very important to see that, you know, as the design goes on. Um, but as long, as long as those big trees are staying, Carrie, can you confirm that? I mean, I see, you know, there's yeah. those two big trees in front of the building. We're not um, removing the big trees. Okay. To my knowledge. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Let me say, in schematic design, I have not. Gary, you should be a lawyer. Degree. To my knowledge, I like that. That was good. Huh? I said you have a future as a as an attorney when you say to my knowledge. I know. I know. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I, what I'm hearing there, though, is that you, you, you'd like to make sure that we we pay special attention to the facade and to the the curb tree. appeal of the building. Yeah. Is, am I hearing you correctly? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, and I, you know, right now there is that big chain link fence, you know, by the the kindergarten yard, I, which, which some, if something, I don't think we have plans to change that, but that would be a, a good change if, if. Um, I would like to see us build that into one of our plans is that eventually we move that chain link in the front of the campus to something yeah. much more um, attractive. Still and, functional, but attractive. Um, and Carrie, just a clarification, the removal of the, um, the portables on the, West and you know behind, you, which you showed on I think the next slide is that happening and that's not happening yet because no you it can't it can't happen it can't until, until you build the other building until okay. this building gets built okay. and then we can take all these portables out yeah. which will be yeah. so much no I, yeah no I remember that discussion yeah we can't wait but yes yeah. I I mean I think that Grant I mean you know I as as Thomas said because I'm. I'm familiar with Grant and Jams the most myself. So, um, I mean, I, I think what is proposed in this first um, um, projects, I, I would support going ahead with them. Um, the library, I mean, that, you know, the impacts of the historic district, I mean, that would be the same case as, um, you know, what we would propose for Jams, that that'd be, Followed with a um, Secretary of Interior standards and um, you know close attention by the historical architects along with the architect. But I don't um, you know this one. I also I don't have a concern about moving forward. I agree, Ralph. Thank you. Um, so I guess my question is: it's not about phase one, which is, is fine. But we're looking at this plan, I'm pointing also with my pen, um, <laughs> is the area between where the, the new buildings, the new um, north-south portion would be added. No, that's east, I'm sorry, east-west, the east-west portion, that one. Yeah. And then the, I'm just asking now, so are they looking at like, the potential impact because it basically stops your view of the old building. Yeah, as part of this CEQA, they would uh, review that question. All right. And since if it's they, not, I mean, since it's not part of the SMS project, it'd be more part of the CEQA process. That's the kind of thing it. that could send this um, this master plan back for revisions. Okay. Correct. It could. Okay. I'm not saying I don't have any opinion on it. I'm just saying that's the. It just that's the kind of thing that they will look at. Um, yes. Now that we'll have in the fall. Yeah, that's something that uh, ARG would take a look at as part of the process. And all that that ARG and the consultant. Yes, and the, that is the, the architectural consultant Archie. from ARG. Right. Okay. So and that that will come back in the fall um, for the next round of, of of looking at where the where these are and review it for the board I'm, as well. I'm right? hoping late spring, but yes. Okay. 
I think Julian said the fall. So yeah, the, the sequel part will come in the fall, but I'm hoping we'll come back and spend more time with these whole before questions. We do, right, before we do the full sequel. Okay. Before we do this full sequel. Great, thank you. Any additional questions about Grant? Okay, we'll move along. Franklin. So Franklin, uh, this is the one where we, it's not a historic district, but it is the front building and the front lawn uh, that are potentially uh, historic resources. So this shows you the rest of the existing campus, the rest of the buildings um, and where we're we going. And this is the area that we're focusing on for the SMS project, the makerspace. We'd remove between four and six of these portables. We're still working with the school whether or not they can lose all six uh, at this time or whether they need to keep two for now. Uh, and that would create this maker space and then also this new field uh, basketball court uh, development with the new fire lane track turn off. And so this is what the SMS project is. It's quite a ways from the historic building. Um, and uh, this one, you know, the, the, the school speaks very importantly about how, how important this is to the campus. They're very excited about this building uh, and how educationally they're going to use it. Uh, there's been a lot of participation from the uh, school administrators and teachers in the design so far of the programming and the schematic design for this building. So it's really developed. And so as far as future plans, uh, coming in initially and doing an L-shaped building here, that allows for us to get rid of more of the portables. And then this uh, extension, another two-story uh, two building here and the TK renovation, which sort of extends uh, all of that area for, uh, for classrooms. We would still maintain these two buildings right here. I think they're S and T. Uh, we'd still maintain the library, the auditorium. We would replace the portable MPR with a new cafeteria kitchen. And then the cafeteria could be more, cafetorium could be more of an auditorium than a cafetorium. So this is where we'd be going eventually with the master plan. We have removed, this is like I said, we've made, we've shit, trimmed this down to more of a 15 year plan rather than a 30 to 40 year plan. So plans to remove these two buildings, build a new library, build a new auditorium, those are tabled. Uh, we need to think something more in our foreseeable future rather than our long term future. For this plan, and so we would only be sequel uh, studying these these parts. Uh, Carrie, I forgot what what was phase two. Phase two is right now is this L building. Okay. And we might do some renovation interior of the admin, or and the TK as part of that. It really depends on funding, but we really want to get the phase two so we can get the rest of the portable classrooms uh, out of here. You know, that we get the modular classrooms, we open up the field space a little more here. So that's the idea is to sort of get this, this next. And then we'd come in here and do this one following that and then see where we are really with enrollment. You know, uh, but I feel like even if we just get the makerspace in this L-shaped building done and leave these other classrooms that are right here, we're going to be in a pretty good place with this campus for a number of years. Carrie, you want to reiterate what, what we're asking for, what we're asking to move forward with right Once now? again, we are asking for uh, uh, your approval to recommend to the board that we move forward with the SMS project, which is the makerspace and the field uh, play yard improvements. Okay, uh, Margaret. Margaret. Yes, I just had a quick question because I'm, I'm very much a latecomer to this master plan project mm -hmm. and the makerspace. Uh, piece in particular. Um, and I was just wondering, I, I, it sounds like there's a great deal of support for this uh, from the Franklin community. And um, I'm just wondering what the discussion has been or what the consideration has been with the, um, whether it's an erosion of open space and the impact on um, open space for the school as well as the community, because I know these yeah. playgrounds are really functioning also mm -hmm. wonderfully. Um, as uh, community playgrounds. Yes, we did a study on that and that study is available that actually uh, this project will not be 
removing um, open space. Uh, all of the characteristics that we currently have with open space will be maintained. So a number of courts, number of play yards, you know, handball walls, all those things will be maintained. Actually, in this process, because we shift the fire lane, we actually pick up additional basketball court space. We do reduce the field a little bit, but we reduce it into an elementary school field as opposed to a middle school, uh, you know, a U10 field as opposed to a U12. Wasn't even quite a U12, it was sort of a little less than U12. So uh, it fits into what we do with middle, with elementary school. Um, but in this way, it does work. We sort of need to push, when we move on to the master plan, we do reopen up, mass, open up space. So overall, there is not a net loss of open space, recreational space. Uh, there will be a little bumpiness along the way during construction, but that's how we would sort of get there. Um, just to say, uh, Thomas has his hand up, Joan has his hand up, sorry, I'm doing your job, Joan, and Wendy, just to say, this is a committee that uh, you'd have to speak during public comment. At the end. Yeah. So um, my question was just about the maker space. Mm -hmm. So how is, because I know there's been a lot of discussion about trying to have, you know, equal type facilities across the various elementary schools. Will Franklin be the only school that has a maker space or is there a plan to have that at other schools? Because my understanding just generally, and I'm not an educator, that is a really important thing, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's project based learning. We know that that's something we want for the 21st century. So, I mean, I know we discussed grant just before. Is there going to be a makerspace like grant sometime or yes. Will Rogers and, and, and what's the thought process on that? And this will this yeah. would be the first if I'm right. right. This would be the first one. There is one planned in the uh, new building at Grant, the first new building at Grant. They would pick up a makerspace there. As soon as we build the new building at Rogers, I'll point this out in a minute, the existing kindergarten rooms would transfer, transform into a makerspace there. There is a space, we're still re-looking re at the master plan in uh, uh, at Roosevelt, but the plan is to get them a maker space relatively soon. Uh, there's a discussion for what we're going to do with Muir Smash in the same way. So we're moving through our process. Actually, McKinley, uh, because they're going to shift their library, they're going to get a new science lab that will be also a maker space this summer as part of a, a, a maintenance project. So that's so they're moving forward with it also. So we're trying to move that across the district. Okay. Harry, this is Jim Pavaro. Yes. Uh, may I just clarify with the grant library renovation, mm -hmm. there will be a new makerspace in that project. That's right. Uh, so I'll go back to, in this, yes, in this room right here. Yeah, if you go forward a couple of slides, it's shown on the proposed plan. Go back. You just go passed back. the floor plan. There you go. There it is, here. In this area with the outdoor use. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a rendering. Is there just on just to follow on the makerspace? Um, I imagine it's like you can say there's a car and there's a Chevrolet, there's a Buick, there's a Cadillac, etc. Is there uh, any kind of uniform definition for that? Or what are the key elements of calling something a maker lab or maker space? The key elements are very well described in your education specifications that your board approved in 2019, and they are the guideline with which we use to design them. So, so can you, can often, you tell us often there's, a, there's a dry space and potentially a wet space. So there's an area that kids can get their hands, you know, painting, sculptural, something, making, building things that is wet. We also have areas with uh, small power tools for the elementary school and other tools that allow them to build, manufacture, develop, you know, uh, where we, we, when we say we're building a makerspace, what's great is at many of our elementary schools, the teachers are already doing it. You know, they're hacking it the best way they can. And so, especially like at Franklin, one of the things the teachers are saying is, I'm already doing this, this, and this. I want to do this and more with the space. And they really were able to describe what they wanted more uh, for that. Uh, uh, at the same time, we also really acknowledge that a maker space is going to be transitional. Uh, uh, what we're doing today with kids in a maker space might be very different in five years. 
And so we're trying to build spaces that have that flexibility and resilience to adapt to what we need as far as the educational. But indoor, outdoor, wet things, I mean, um, let me see if I can go back to the plan here. You know, um, the plan, the resource center, you know, it has, it has wet areas, it has storage areas, it has lots of counter space. It has, you know, lots of ability for electricity and other things. It has the outdoor space presentation platform. It has many of the different sort of features that are now being discussed as regular in a, major, in a maker space. Okay, that's great. I mean, I think what I'd like to see is what the square footage is on each and what are the elements. Oh, okay. I mean, an architect referring back to a guidelines, that's not really an effective use of time. I can start playing on all those kinds of games. What I'd like to see is that to me looks like a Cadillac, the Franklin. And I, what I'm curious is if this district is saying that we want to have equality, I'm just curious if we have similar amenities at each school. Mm -hmm. I can, and, and I want it in English, not in referrals to guidelines that are 100 pages long. Okay, uh, I'd say still take a look at the guidelines. They're pretty good, uh, but they are they are aspirational. Um, where they will be different is that each of the elementary schools does have a different character. And uh, while we want to be um, have a, have equality, uh, Franklin was sort of pushing more in this form, where if you talk to the principal at Will Rogers, you get a different response of what that space is going to look like. Um, matter of fact, later on, uh, when we go to Rogers, Ryan Burke, our principal is here, and he might be able to say a few words about what he sees for that at Rogers. Also, Nancy Murphy is one of our teachers who's, who's gonna speak when we get to Rogers. Okay. So um, on Franklin, uh, are there any other questions before we yeah. move on? Um, I just want to say, basically, look, I, I went to Franklin and um, I'm excited about the new programs that are being proposed there and the new built the new makerspace and the buildings. It's because of the way it's designated and because the front of the school will be maintained for the neighborhood and the and it's really the area along the alley that will have the biggest change. I don't think that really impacts the historical uh, significance of the school. So I'm inclined to um, support this as well. Uh, anyone else have comments? Um, I, I agree. With, I agree with Joan. I think um, certainly, you know, for Franklin, that that the front of the school, you know, is not being touched um, at this at this stage. I, you know, I th I think it would be great to see this makerspace and see how you know how it works and you know in terms of planning um, for other schools. So I support going ahead with this one too. Okay. And I don't see any other hands. So go ahead. Okay, Will Rogers. So here is the designated uh, or the, the uh, uh, historical boundary uh, of the proposed historic district. Uh, and then we have lots of portables and modulars and other things around it. Uh, that includes the interstitial areas between the finger buildings. Um, We'd be looking to eventually, you know, as with the new building, remove these portables. We'd get rid of these two early. Uh, these are currently our uh, some early childhood portables, and that would lead us to building this new building and also the new field. Uh, when we take out the portables, we pick up some additional blacktop space. And so, you know, the, for recreational space, it changes between phases, but it looks like we're maintaining all of you know the same quality and amount of, of uh, space as we move through uh, the process. So this is the first building. We do, we do something here in this area that's eventually going to become driveway. It really depends on funding as far as how quickly we get there. Uh, the next phase would be potentially to remove these modulars, and then we would go to adding this new uh, two-story building with classroom and the new driveway drop-off pickup area. And then this is where the kindergarten rooms would become the new makerspace uh, renovations. And we'd renovate the middle interstitial areas between these buildings, um, still maintaining the relationships, which is of course the most important thing in the historic, uh, but uh, we would get, get our way there. Then eventually food services would be added there. And at this moment, that's where we would stop the master plan. Now, originally, 
back in the day, you know, everyone would talked about tearing down Franklin, uh, tearing down Will Rogers and replacing it. And that's been a discussion in the district for more than 20 years. Uh, so when we just started off the design for this, we said, let's plan how we incrementally do that. But we feel like we've done a lot of work with the buildings, with the finger buildings, adapting them and improving them. Um, and we might need to do some interior work in the auditorium when the cafeteria gets built or somehow figuring out how those two play. But we do feel like for master planning purposes, this is as far as we would go. And for sequel purposes, we, this is as far as we'd go and we'd not pursue the older plan that we had to go ahead and replace everything. So that's where we feel pretty confident that this building, the first step, the SMS project, is a good first step and will not create a condition that would uh, that would cause a change in the overall scope of the build, you know, of the historic impact the historic district in the future. We feel like this is a good positive step. Uh, I did want to uh, just for a moment, Margaret, just for before yeah. I. Sure. For that, I did ask uh, Ryan Burke, our principal, and uh, and he wanted to bring with him Nancy Murphy, is one of our early childhood educators, just to talk about the importance of this building. I felt sometimes the, in the last meeting we got a little far field from the educational, and I wanted just to make sure we're including that in our conversation. So, Nancy, you had a few words you wanted to say. Just that I'm really excited. I'm an early childhood special education teacher. I've been teaching in portable classrooms in the district for the last. 13 years, maybe part of one year, I was in a real room, a real room. And um, the idea of getting out of these damaged, termite infested, disgusting portables is high on my list um, before I retire. <laughs> um, and I um, am excited to see some changes for in between those finger buildings that maybe make some of that ground a little more permeable for um, any kind of rain reclamation project and that kind of a thing, it makes me really excited. Right. Yeah, Terry, can I say a few words yes, as well please. regarding this? I think, you know, we've, we're, we're talking a lot at the more global perspective of master planning across multiple campuses. And when I think of a student's trajectory when they first enter the school as a four-year-old and when they leave as a fifth grader, part of our educational master plan is the experience that the students receive in each of their grade levels. And when we consider our very youngest students, whether it's pre-K, TK, or kindergarten, that space in which they reside for those initial years is absolutely essential. It's not just a, a maker space in which students come in to create. It is an actual space, a maker space for the kids when they are there learning the fundamentals and building that foundation of a solid education. It's essential that that environment is conducive to their learning. It's happy, it's joyful, it's bright, it's airy, and they are deserving of um, they are deserving, like Nancy said, of, of, a, of a better facility and to offer our young students this proposed phase one plan of a new building speaks a lot about who we are as a school, as a school district and as a community that we are investing in these students early experiences, knowing full well that part of their master plan, it will contribute to their later experiences. So I like Nancy, I'm very excited about this. Um, I'm an early childhood teacher at heart. My initial career experiences were in kindergarten and in first grade. And I, I do um, see a tremendous amount of value in proceeding with this. So thank you, Carrie. Thank you. And everyone. Yeah. So Margaret had her hand up and, oh, sorry. Carrie, no, and I'm doing your job again. <laughs> Carrie, this is, this is interesting to me. I, I'm going back to the sort of the big picture that you've, you've laid out. Um, I'm, I'm actually, um, seeing now it, it appears that essentially that you in in the in the few weeks since the hri has been um released and and digested that there's been a um essentially a, a re uh rethinking of the master plan not only spatially and in terms of physical impact on the campus but also in terms of the um the time horizon can you can you sort of give me an idea of how we went from something that saw a master plan that saw really the wholesale configuration reconfiguration and rebuilding of, of Will Rogers to what we're seeing tonight? So this is 
great sort of new information for for us. Certainly, uh, yeah. I, I as I as I uh, preface before, um, you know, for 20 years the discussion in the district has been about replacing this campus. Whenever we rebuilt uh, Edison, there was some talk that we'd actually rebuild Will Rogers instead. Uh, and so this was always a plan. So part of our initial work with the designers on the master plan for this process was, I mean, I, I started off by giving them direction that said, figure out a way to replace this campus over time, because that's what we had heard from um, uh, board members and multiple discussions. Uh, Judith might remember, because she's, I hate to, hate to say she's been here for the, for the longest, but she was part of those early discussions. As we got the historic resource report and as we discussed it, as we looked at that, we talked about historic districts. Also, the other thing that is really significant that has occurred is we've done major modernization here on this campus. Uh, we've changed the wind, you know, we've, we've replaced the windows that were the originals, which were not functioning for us. We put in air conditioning, we've done windows, uh, paint floor, doors, uh, new technology. So the classrooms are much better not larger, we wish they were larger, uh, but they're much better, they're much uh, more conducive to learning uh, than what we had before. Because when you would walk, if you'd really compare walking into the campus uh, seven years, six years ago and walking in today, it's a very different experience. So matching that with the historic resource, there is a thought that goes, uh, this is how far we'll go. Also, the other real important thing right. is, and we talked a lot about this in our master planning, is we now. wanted to think our way through but a now. full 30 year plan, but we're not going to have money for all of that. We're not, it's not, you know, it's in 15, you know, usually a, a five or 10 year plan is a good idea uh, in facilities because in 10 years, something will change, but we feel like these are good for steps and we can say, this is how far we'll go. That doesn't mean that 20 years from now with changes of enrollment, changes in education, changes in a hundred different other factors, the community might have a very different experience, but for this point, this is what we feel like would be useful. Does that answer your question, Margaret? It, it sort of does. I just, um, I, it just seems like a, a, a dramatic, um, a, a dramatic um, rethinking. That's, that's what I'm, and I, I'm, I, I'm just not under, I, it's, it's just a comment and, and uh, a question. Yeah, it, it, you, do, you did address it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Harry, should I, can I go? Yeah. Um, I think well, maybe a lot of you know, I don't know if that you do, but I, I had four children go through Will Rogers from kindergarten to fifth grade. So I was at the school forever. I had, school is near and dear to my heart. I love that school. Um, I do have to say the windows, paint, floor, and door project just been just amazing. There was a sub, definitely substandard windows going on there. Um, I think the school, I like the finger configuration. I think it's kind of cool. It's got a lot of character. Um, I like the new project. I definitely think it makes a lot of sense. Um, I do want to put in my two cents that I think it's really important. Uh, I guess you're repainting the school. I did not know that, but at one point they were talking about a different color for this new building. And I said, I think it's important for the kindergarten and preschool to feel like they're part of Will Rogers, not like a little separate building. So it should somehow be like, yay, we're here, we're at school, this is our school. And so any way you can make that, it seem like this is part of the school by paint colors and, and some stylistic choices that kind of make it look like it goes with the school, I think is a really a good idea. But generally I'm, I'm very happy with this rethinking of everything. Margaret. Yeah, just one more question. Um, I recall seeing, we're, we're talking about Rogers now, I recall seeing um, a schematic of the proposed building uh, during our last meeting. And yeah. I was um, a little concerned about uh, compatibility issues, even though uh, we're talking about something that is actually separate from the historic campus. Um, how is the new design uh, addressing its context. And um, it seems very sort of streamlined and, and solid um, uh, and a little bit intimidating. I mean, we're talking about, a, uh, we're talking about a building now. And so on, now I'm addressing, because I think this is important, um, an important issue as we're, 
as we're moving through these proposed SMS projects. Um, if um, if we're, we're accepting the sort of general approach vis-a-vis uh, -vis the new campus master plan, which has suddenly emerged out of, you know, out of almost nowhere. So this is important new information. I'm um, also like to put on the table my question and my actual, my genuine concern about the architectural concept and character of, of this building in relation to the rest of the historic campus. Uh, also, it's it's um, a building for children, and what are we seeing here? We're seeing something very solid, very um, um, enclosed, at least as it faces the playing field. Um, so I'd, I'd like I I think that I I would be very reluctant to support um, a project that is going to um, have. Um, uh, uh, be uh, the, the lack of compatibility and the lack of, um, from what I can tell, um, uh, suitability for um, its purpose. Um, so uh -huh. I'd like to put that on the table since since we're now getting down to the the, the gritty. I mean, this is this is an important discussion I think for for our committee as we um, you know as we consider uh, these SMS projects. I, I fully agree. Uh, I want to say that uh, the uh, uh, we are with completing schematic design, but in design development is is where you know we sort of know what the building is going to function and what the shape will be. We don't yet know what it will look like, and we have time to do a lot of the aesthetics. Uh, in the past, uh, what we've done is we've uh, put together a small subgroup of the FDAC uh, as a support for some design. You know, assistance and sort of design review, uh, and that is uh, we've benefited from that in the past. Uh, I was I say in the past we've leaned a little bit on our architects on the committee to assist with that, uh, but that would be something we might recommend, Joan uh, Chair, if you wanted to put together maybe a subcommittee of people who wanted to spend a little more time looking at the aesthetics, that would be something to do. I think that's a really good idea. And I know Judith wants to speak, but just one of the things that struck me in these historical resources reports was a sentence or quote of the dearth of visual continuity. I don't know if I'm saying that all right, but the idea that I do think we need to consider that um, with some of these buildings. And, and I think that that's kind of one of the things that maybe got this whole thing going. So I, th I think it's important to have to take some of that into consideration. Um, I think Ralph and Alexis would be great uh, with their experience to be on the subcommittee, uh, a, like a design subcommittee. And I don't know. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a designer. I'm, I'm an interior Margaret. designer. But I, I would, if, if there's room for me, I would, I would be more than happy to volunteer for that. I, I think that's a I, I, don't, I don't know that we need to decide that right now because it's not, um, but That's right. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. Joan, I'll coordinate with you outside of this so we can we can set that up. Right. Sorry, go, Judith, Judith was next. You're, you're, you need Judith, to unmute. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, actually, I was, I was going to suggest that you form a design subcommittee um, because I recall how helpful it was. And, you know, we used to meet monthly. Now we meet quarterly or maybe bi-monthly. I don't really, you know, but um, so I think it really makes a difference. And um, we do have expertise um, on this committee. So I, I, I wholeheartedly support that. So my question was, um, and, I, and I, I agree with Margaret about what the, is shown on this building. Like I would not, I would not support going forward you know, with a building that looked like this, um, because I, I, you know, I don't think it relates to the campus, and it, it, it's not a very friendly building. Um, but my question was more about um, the second phase. So I think you know the first phase, um, the early childhood building is at the back of the campus. You know, it's not you know anywhere near um, the historic historic. Um, buildings. But in the second phase, you show another two-story building, um, and that's to take out all the, all the portables. Is that correct? It's to replace those classrooms. So I'm just concerned, you know, about what impact that building would have 
um, you know, of views of the historic building. So I know we're not talking about phase two now, but, you know, just in terms of looking at um, the planning for phase two, you know, if you didn't put a, a two-story building there, um, you know, to minimize any impacts to the original buildings, you know, what, you know, what else could, could be done. So I know that that's going to be looked at um, as part of the CEQA review. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, my other question is in phase one, um, where's the, could you just put the phase one? I just wanted to make, look at the parking. Um, okay. Hang so, on a second. Yeah, where's the parking? Uh, okay. So here's there. And then, so phase one, um, when we finish, hang on. I got to go back to the beginning to get my. <laughs> okay. Okay. When this is done, we shave off a little bit of the parking here, but we still maintain part of the parking that we bought from the church. So with this parking, this parking, and this parking, we actually have more spaces than we had before uh, we got the church lot. Uh, we're still looking at how much of the church lot we need to keep to maintain it. And then as we go to the next phase is when we add the parking here. And then the question is how much, you know, so we are able to go back. So. Uh, we came to this parking in that space. You see, we have, you know, we get still, especially once these bungalows are gone, we, we regain a lot of the open black blacktop space. We might have lost, you know, so there will be a moment in here, you know, right here where we're building the building and we are, you know, have the portable still in place that will be maybe a little shy of recreational. But then as soon as we get that building completed, we'll get rid of these portables and return recreation space. Also, this will, this, K yard will become also more usable for the uh, first through fifth grades at that point. Oh, are, are you planning to, to put more equipment or something in that when you take those yeah, out? Yeah, we, we'd look at how we switch around equipment to match the, the right size age group because the play yards for the kindergartens would move to this area here. Right, okay. Carrie, just one quick more question. <laughs> Sorry, because because we're seeing we're seeing a, a completely revised master plan tonight. This is the first time we've seen it. I think it's any any members of the public who are watching. It's also the first time they've seen it, and um, so um, I'm I'm a little troubled by the the lack of um, of uh, public access in a sense to this new information and the ability of the public to comment on it. And I was wondering if we might have um, an opportunity after your presentation to reopen public comments because of this new information. It hasn't been noticed and it hasn't been, um, I mean, this is, this is significant. Yeah, it's, it's very, actually it's, I have to say, I'm sort of encouraged and surprised that the, the district is, and your, your teams have been really thinking through and digesting a lot of the information from the HRI, but it's, it's, it's new to me and it's, probably new to the public too. So okay. I, I think we need- So Margaret, we need, yes. I, I think I'd like to address that. The item before us tonight is not reviewing the master plan. It is not to recommend right. approval of the master plan. It's right, to recommend right. continuing with design of phase one. So any further comment on the master plan would be not very relevant to that. Okay. However, this is what we said we'd do from the beginning. If we go through the HRRs, or the, the HRI process, I guess, and determine that there is an impact, then we will take another look at the master plan. We're doing that here. We're also doing that at Roosevelt because in those two, there were significant impacts. This is what the district has said we would do. It's exactly what we're doing. The reason we're asking to go forward with phase one is because phase one can go forward with any number of revised master plans, including the, the option that we see in front of us, because this may not be where we end up, but phase one can go forward with this, with the original, with some other version, and not be wasted. We, we, we think we can still go forward with phase one, put in this important project for this campus, and that's why we want to design it. The rest of the master plan, you're absolutely right, will be reviewed, will be obviously further developed. I mean, this is something that's been done in recent weeks and days. Um, we've got work to do. We, we know that. We're not done yet. And I'd also, I'd also say, Margaret, if you go back to the uh, original presentation, so, you know, the ones we did on the master planning back, you know, a year ago, 
Mm -hmm. you will see a slide that looks exactly like this as the phase three of the project without the blue outline. So essentially all we said was, we're now just gonna go up through phase three and stop. I see, okay. So, so this was, this is, it's not like we drew a whole new master plan. We literally just went up to phase three and stopped and saying that we probably will stop there. And that's all we will sequel. Uh, that's what's all, all we'll do as part of the sequel. Right. So, I, I, so, I, so that, people who, who that learned, is true. Yeah. It, might, it might not be so surprising to people who went through the journey. Okay. Well, but let me just say one more thing. But if, if that's the case, it still handicaps us a, a little bit um, in evaluating the SMS projects, particularly on Rogers and on um, McKinley, because um, because those those two SMS projects really were developed uh, without the benefit of of the HRI, and so um, I, I now I'm seeing a, a revised uh, plan for 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 Rogers. But to sort of echo Judith Meister's comment about how this additional, this two-story building might might impact um, the historic district uh, is is an evaluation that that obviously needs needs to happen down the line. In full agreement with that statement that it needs to happen down the line. Yeah, and Alexis has had her hand up patiently for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm enjoying listening to everybody's comments and I, I joined late, but um, I think I'm feeling similar that I, I don't feel like I have enough information here with this building. It's hard um, to understand the scale of it. And it's, I also feel like um, I would love more information about the overall point of view of the styles of architecture that we're putting on the different campuses. And um, this particular modeling of what we see now in SD looks very different from what the campus has on it. And so how that integrates with the surrounding buildings and how it integrates with the street and the experience of coming in and you know being able to see that in terms of the scale, in terms of child size and how, um, how that thought process is going before we move it into DD, would would really like to know more of that information. Okay, even though that a lot of the things you've just asked for are the things that we would be doing in DD. I mean, we is. can't we can't do DD. I mean, you know, it, we we can't go any forward with the design from what we've done now unless we go into DD because that that's the net you know that's I, I, what i'm saying is, is 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 if we stop tonight what we're doing at rogers then mm -hmm. we're stopped until i mean it's like the architects aren't working anymore it's like that's they, they've yes. worked up to this point and but i would so, say just the massing that i'm seeing here now i i just i just want to understand a little bit more the point of view of um favreau architects does beautiful work so i know whatever they're going to do they're going to do beautiful work, but I'm just trying to understand as a community what we are looking for on our campuses. And this is this is architecturally very different, right? And so this and there's a similar feel to that at McKinley. And I I feel like as a whole we haven't really understood that point of view. All right, I, I think we have got Ralph and Ryan. I don't know who was first, um, but good point, Alexis. But I think Ryan was. Brian? Hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to reiterate what I had said before, that there's an urgency to this, and I, I just want to make that very clear. We're dealing with young students who are in very inappropriate conditions right now. The longer this takes to actually proceed with phase one and have a building in which we can educate safely and productively these students, um, the, the longer they will need to remain in these portable buildings. There's an urgency, and I'm here as the principal of the school, representing the students that I currently have sitting in these classrooms and the students in, for future generations that will be coming through here. So I understand and I hear what others are saying and I agree and I've been a part of this process the entire time that aesthetics are very important. The historical considerations are very important. Space, everything that we've addressed tonight. However, delaying this project another year as far as I'm concerned is not acceptable and I know that it is not acceptable to the parents who are currently 
families of the school and for those families and students that will be coming up in the years to come. And I think their, their voices are very, very important because they're the ones, their ch children are the ones in these classrooms. So I just wanted to, to yeah. say that once again, we need to think of the students. This is a school. Well, I would say then, um, we think if, we were, Thank you. if we were going to, as a whole, decide to move this one forward um, and, and understand that urgency and decide to move into DD, then I would at least ask that we meet more frequently to see the development, because I feel like so much time passes and then we don't get that chance to evaluate. I, I agree. I feel like uh, we need to be meeting a lot more with this committee. Uh, also, uh, maybe you would also perhaps be interested in being in our design review subcommittee, because I think we'd really appreciate your voice and yeah, I mean, experience. I know Ralph wants to talk. I'll let Ralph talk first. Go, Ralph. Okay. So, um, and particularly to Ryan, it, nobody's trying to stop this for a year. Um, and that, you know, that's certainly not the intent. I don't think, believe it's going to happen. And by the way, I'm a parent of a lot of my kids here in the 80s and 90s. Um, but the change is, you know, the forward thinking change is dramatic. And it may be, and I can't remember, Carrie, if, if, if phase three actually did have a two-story building in this very same location. Okay. So here's an opportunity. So I think it's a great um, decision to say, you know, that everything we've done and all the money we've poured in to the so-called finger buildings into the historic fabric, um, give us quality of spaces that, you know, that, that we need. And we just need to supplement, some of the supplementing it, the maker space, um, you know, they've always wanted, you know, better food service and a, and a, and a community space. That's been on the, sort of on the books for forever, 30 years plus. Um, but having sort of made that change about the future, I, I think we can, you know, our eminent architects can take a quick look, you know, it's a week or two, to really look at whether like the one and two story buildings should flip, should the field turn 90 degrees and, you know, we've got really three components here, right? We've got a multi-purpose facility, we've got a preschool K facility, and we've got you know, new classroom pieces. And is there another way to arrange them that doesn't put a two-story piece right next to the old building in a way that does impact? I think, I think it's what Alexis was, you know, was talking about. That's not a big thing to look at. I mean, I think that can be, I'm confident that can be looked at really quickly. And it's the same issue we're going to talk about in McKinley. You know, are there options, you know, that are less, that have less um, visual and you know, other kinds of, of impact on the older buildings? And I think that can be done really, really quickly. Yeah, it's moving pieces around on the board at this point. If we go ahead and, you know, and do the design development and look at stuff and then decide, we've wasted more time stopping later on, which is say, no, no, now we really can't stop because the time you would have to take to review and potentially change stuff would be even longer. Now it really is the right time, you know, to just take that step back, take the, 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 the global view one more time, see if, if, we had, if we've created an opportunity for where the pieces can go. Um, and if this is the right thing, we'll just move on. If, it, if there is something that's, that's better, you can bring it back, you know, really quickly. And I, you know, I'm confident that um, that can be done and it's not gonna um, really put this thing out of whack. It's not, it's not you know. Yeah, the, the, the challenge I see is we cannot afford a two-story building and measure SMS. Well, I know we can't, but so if it's part of the but I don't my, think Ralph was saying that. I think, I think I, what I heard was he was saying is let's look at where these things are end up living on the final campus master plan and there might be a way to put that two-story building somewhere else if we reconfigure it. it doesn't sound like that would take too long to try to lay up and there may be you know problematic pro programmatic operational issues you know says well that we we can't do that but it's been a long time since we've all looked at this so i guess we're just saying let's take another look and and it can be done quickly because it's just at this scale basically um, and it is moving pieces, uh, and I agree. I, I don't want to delay the opening of this building one day. 
Um, and I don't think you know, that, that we have to, it's just to take, you know, the ones that everybody feels really good about, they're gonna move, they're gonna move forward quickly. And one or two of them, we're gonna take a little more time to um, take a quick look. And I think we all feel that way. Great. Uh, should we say, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking. Alexis, I think you were next. I just forgot to take my hand down. Um, okay, Margaret. Yes, um, I just wanted to um, piggyback on Ralph's suggestion um, because I, I think what he's talking about um, uh, really um, defines a bit of my uneasiness about, about this, that um, I understand, I see this reconfigured plan, but I think what is what has been done here is really just sort of stopping <laughs> essentially at, at phase two or you know the and not going to the full build out. So given the the shorter uh, time horizon and given the fact that we are we have recognized this historic district, I would certainly support I would cer certainly support moving forward with the SMS plan only on the proviso that, um, there be um, a, a concentrated effort to um, take a fresh look at these pieces that could be moved around. Um, I I'm certainly understand the urgency and the, the, the sense of, of, of urgency that, that the school community feels about um, creating these new facilities for the youngest students. But um, we're so close now to to really getting, uh, I think, uh, a much more informed um, master plan. And if this is the best way to go, so be it. But um, as Ralph indicates, a, a, a very short time frame. Uh, in a very short time frame, I think we could accomplish either confirming that this is the best way, or finding maybe a new a new way to move these pieces around. So I would be prepared in that sense to. Um, give a, only a conditional um, on this particular project, only a conditional um, uh, yay um, in uh, pending uh, confirmation of uh, the master plan. I would agree with that. I, I would too. I, I mean, that's a good, you can turn that into a motion. That was pretty good, Margaret. Yeah, so we, we need to go through the others, but I, yeah. I think that yeah. the, the same, the same might apply to one other uh, project right. that's coming our way. And let's go. I mean, we're going to move forward. I I am concerned about your motion and what you're moving forward because I think we will have lost doing Rogers this year. Yeah, can I say one more thing, Carrie? That I do have to jump off. I mean, I'm also deeply concerned about that motion, um, considering that uh, this is not, in fact, a decision made by parents and students who are currently at the school. And I think that that. Current motion is not going to go over well with the families and the kids that are um, going to stand to lose from this if there's a delay. So I just wanted to say that as the principal of the school. Yeah. But, I, you know, I could I could see this as part of the design development, that the design development phase really incorporate as well a confirmation of, of that 15-year horizon master plan. I mean, that... It, Ralph, I would be interested in your, your thoughts on, on that. Can I just say one thing real quick? I mean, one of the reasons why that second building was where it is now is because the original master plan had all the buildings being placed around the edges of the campus, mm -hmm. you recall. Yeah. Right. So we didn't design, put that there, or put any of these things there, knowing that we were going to keep the finger building. So I think Ralph has a very good point, and I don't think it has to take long. I, I feel like the architects are pretty creative and just, it's like playing Tetris. Is something else, could something else work? If it can't, we can know that. And maybe we just agree to meet, like maybe we push forward the, the projects that we've already accepted and ask for a little time with this one, like maybe two weeks even, just to know that the layout is gonna be the layout that we're gonna want. That's, I think that's all we're trying to say. I don't think we're trying to really delay this project tremendously. Look, I, I, I hear the principal's you know, concerns because parents haven't, if there's a change, parents haven't looked at it. Um, so I think, you know, but that's the kind of thing I think that Carrie and Steve have to go back and look at, you know, 
the schedule of it. Uh, is a is a is a really big decision. Um, you know, to move. I just wanted to say one last thing that I, I think whatever we we do, uh, whatever we ultimately end up saying about Rogers tonight, I I think we want to. I mean, from my standpoint, I would want to say that we are we do want this to move forward. We don't want to delay this. That this that we recognize the urgency of of getting rid of those terrible um, buildings for the little kids. And so, you know, I, you know, I think we have to look to um, Stephen and, and Carrie to say, well, what's reasonable? Can we come, I mean, can we go forward and do that as design development, the first step of that um, to look at the placement of the buildings or, or do something even quicker um, so as we don't you know, lose a year on, on Rogers. I think McKinley may be more problematic, and I guess we're going to move on to that. But because um, I guess we're running out of time. But I, I mean, as a committee, we all—and I'll let you speak just like, as a committee—we all agreed, and we all absolutely agree that this is a priority for the school, and that's why we wanted to move move it forward. There was other projects that we didn't do, but this was one of the projects that we thought was really important to move forward. So we're not saying it's not important. Um, I just want to make sure we I mean, know. Um, I think ahead, I think you could I think you could potentially accomplish Judith's, Judith's point by moving this forward with an unqualified motion, directing I mean sorry recommending that the board direct us to go forward with design. The one caveat would be that we create a um, like a I guess a design review subcommittee that will meet with the architects, and obviously that's going to be the focus of that subcommittee on this campus because I think. Everyone who's on that subcommittee is in this meeting right now and has heard that, um, you know, and, and we would obviously keep bringing it back to this committee for re, for review. As you know, we don't come to this committee and ask for approval of designs. Um, but I think the, the subcommittee will help guide us through that process, guide our, our team rather through that process to get us to something that accomplishes both that meets Ryan and, and the students needs now and in the, in the near or in the future, as well as, um, you know, the aesthetic concerns that I think Margaret uh, um, eloquently pointed out. Uh, you know, I, I think that would be the solution rather than recommending approval of some of these and not others, and we're going to come back with, with the rest of them. Um, we obviously are dying to move forward with this, uh, but we want to do it right. So I, that's how I think we get to doing it right. Um, but obviously, you guys will make, make the motion and, and you'll vote on it. I think that's good. Very good. Do you want to write up that lengthy motion, Steve? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're we'll, going to move we'll on to McKinley. Out, yeah. Uh, just because I, I know I see our time. We, we spent a good bit of time on this one. So uh, here's the uh, outline for McKinley of the proposed historic district boundary. Um, here's the, the, the portables we're looking to remove, all the ones in dark gray. And this is the first phase building, the SMS project uh, with the parking lot, which gets these portables out. Uh, then the second uh, phase would be removing the pre-K modular, which is not a non-historic building. Uh, and then one more building out on the edge here. And then the cafeteria improvements, the historic courtyard improvements, the, the improvements to the faculty center, um, the new elevator, uh, new parking would be part of the next bit. And that's pretty much where we would stop. So like, just like with Rogers, uh, taking in what we've looked, we'd basically phase three phases and then we would end. Uh, and that's what we would sequa. So we would not be doing the further buildings that we had discussed uh, along this edge, or would we be doing anything on the front yard uh, new cafeteria, cafeteria or auditorium. So we just get our ways through this part and um, that's what we would be proposing. So uh, I did want to uh, bring on uh, Tra uh, Paul, Travis, because um, we've had him at, we asked him really about the question of the relationship of this building um, to the historical resources 
and we ask him to do some uh, preliminary analysis into that because that would be what he'd be doing as part of CEQA. So I wonder, Paul, if you wanted to talk about where you are and what your thoughts are on that. Sure, Carrie. Um, so I think, you know, probably like this group, uh, we were introduced to this um, scheme in a slide presentation by the architect sort of explaining what they wanted to do and, and the programmatic concerns. Um, we have not done uh, in-depth analysis of this. I just wanna say that up front. Um, but preliminarily, I think that, you know, there's sort of two standards we're, we're going to be looking at. One is a straight CEQA evaluation where um, does, would this, would this cause a significant impact to a historical resource? And significant impacts as defined under CEQA are largely concerned with material impacts that, um, you know, degrade the, um, or even eliminate the uh, resources ability to convey its historic significance. And so I think, you know, at, at first pass, we think it probably can clear that standard, the CEQA standard of avoiding significant impact. I think the question, and this is something that we're gonna have to talk about, and, it, and I think it will mirror a lot, probably mirrors a lot of the concerns expressed here tonight, is the higher standard of the Secretary of the Interior standards. And is, is this, does this building in the way it's currently configured do that? And I think there are qu legitimate questions there. And so certainly um, as the design move forward, I think that's gonna be paramount to how we might uh, be looking at how it can evolve. But I think that's probably as much as I can say right now, Carrie, I don't know if that was, okay. uh, that answers your, your, your concern. Okay, thank you. Sure. Margaret? My question, uh, Paul, you left us hanging. Um, legitimate questions on, on the higher standard regarding um, um, the Secretary of Inter Interior Standards. Could you um, elaborate that on a little bit? Uh, elaborate on that a bit, just to say what your questions are, even though you may not have had come to any conclusions? Um, yeah, well, you know, uh, Margaret, so the standards, um, and we're talking, so the standards for rehabilitation, when we're talking about um, either an addition or, you know, new construction, related new construction, there are two standards, standard nine and standard 10. 10 is often the easier one, because what that asks is that if the new construction were removed, would the resource be left in you know generally as it was uh, mm -hmm. before the construction happened, and that and so because this is largely a detached building, um, there are some small connections, but they're they're pretty minor and and largely just a, um, a communication uh, framework, um, circulation framework. Excuse me, that that seems to be a pretty straightforward question. Mm -hmm. But the more thorny one is standard nine, where you're talking about compatibility in size, scale, and massing, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then that brings into questions of the placement of the building, um, you know, the, you know what, what that does in terms of um, potentially blocking views from the streets and, you know, is there, so is there a way maybe to open that up and, and get some partial view? Is there a way to maybe, you know, uh, shift the location of the building slightly so that we, we, we you know, and then, you know, there's a lot, there's questions about just the overall massing, the styling, materials, you know, this roof line, everything. We'd have to really think about that in terms of, um, in terms of the Secretary of Interior Standards and what mm -hmm. they would be looking for. But again, I, I don't want to get too specific about this design because we, you know, I, I will literally be, you know, thinking about it on the fly here. But I do think that just at first blush, that, uh, those questions of compatibility as, as mandated, or not as mandated, but as guided by the standards are, are questions that are presented here and that we would have to really think about. Thank you, that was very helpful. Sure. Anyone else on the committee of questions, comments? I would just like to comment again. I think we have the same 
situation here is we, but I think it's a little more uh, problematic and, and troubling um, that we had with, with Rogers, although I think Rogers is probably going to be a little easier to, to resolve, um, which is the, um, the fact that essentially the master plan, uh, the long-term, the 30-year plan developed from McKinley now being truncated to a sort of phase two, a shorter horizon. Um, again, we're, we're looking at, at a, a plan that was nonetheless developed without the benefit of the historic resources evaluation. And, um, and I think particularly in this case with um, the concerns about um, uh, the standard 10 that uh, Paul talked about. Um, very helpfully, um, I I am uh, I think probably of all of the projects probably most concerned of, about this this one in particular because it it it, it it's the placement. Um, in other words, we haven't had the luxury of being able to step back and say, can we move the pieces around to meet the educational needs to meet the program without um, the the impacts um, that um, are, are being suggested by this first piece. Um, and so that's that's where where I I'm, I'm feeling a little a little more hesitant and and a little more troubled by um, uh, any action we might take to to move this this particular piece forward. Um, Carrie, can I? Share yes, something? thank you, Ashley. I, 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 oh, you're you're listed as Dr. Benjamin. I didn't see. You. <laughs> I kept writing Ashley. I'm like Ashley's not here. I wanted to bring in uh, uh, Dr. Ashley Benjamin, our principal at this campus. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. I'm Dr. Benjamin, principal of McKinley. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. So I'm I'm a little surprised and concerned. I'm hearing the word problematic come up. Um, this is something, you know, I've been involved with the uh, architects and we've had a committee for and many meetings for for years and years now. And it's um, something just to echo what uh, Ryan was saying about Rogers that is really desperately needed and has been very, very thought out. And there's a reason why the building is where it is. Um, just to start about a few key points, um, mostly I'm going to talk about the phase one project, which is that building. So it's a two-story building to replace the nine old temporary bungalows, and it is desperately needed. The old bungalows were always meant to be temporary. They're old, they're falling apart, they're small. So while our teachers are excellent, they could teach anywhere, they could teach in a shed in the snow if they needed to, but they shouldn't have to teach in these type of facilities. We want them to be able to teach in a space that enhances their instruction. And we want students to be able to move and collaborate where they can have creative 21st century learning experiences. And our students really deserve to have this large, beautiful building to replace these bungalows so they can get a learning environment where they get exceptional instruction. In terms of why this building is in the front is because at our many community meetings we've had over the years, the design of where the yard is and the yard space is extremely important to our families. Mm -hmm. um, also, this building creates a designated drive-through car drop-off, which you can see in one of the little, yes, right there. Um, this is desperately needed for student safety. So currently cars have to drive through our parking lot where all the cars are parked to drop off and pick up. So that means that students are running between moving cars and parking cars, which is extremely dangerous. Whereas this new designated drop off would be much safer and ensures that a student isn't hit by a car and that there's less car accidents, which we have frequently in the parking lot. And it also helps students then get to class on time and helps parents get to work on time. So Santa Monica Boulevard is not an option, neither is the alley, neither is Arizona. So that's why we need that car drop off. Um, also, this new building would create a new entrance to the school that would allow the school to be more secure. So right now, the way the office is designed, anyone could fairly easily access the school, whereas this new design allows for more security so that our students and staff are safe on campus. Um, another benefit of this building is parent engagement. 
So the new building has a designated parent center area with meeting rooms, conference rooms. So parents have multiple places to interact and collaborate with the school. Right now, they're literally in a basement. Our parent room is a basement. So this building would actually reflect our school viewpoint that parents are partners in their child's school and it would encourage volunteerism and collaboration. Uh, also with this new drive through it would actually have parking spaces for parents, which we don't have right now. So again, that's that parents as partners, we want them to be able to park, come to school, volunteer, help at field trips and things. Uh, so basically to summarize, the new building is really critical both to the safety of students and the staff and the school as a whole and to the learning of our students. The temporary bungalows were never meant to be permanent structures. We need a permanent classroom space that allows for 21st century learning. And McKinley's been around for over 100 years and this building is really the future of education for our children. And it's something that we've been talking about as a school for years and is gonna be excellent for our children and is very supported certainly by staff and families. And certainly we can talk about details about this design to make it fit into the overall look of the school. But I'm very concerned about sort of the messaging I'm hearing that there's big issues, which I don't think um, there have been, especially given all the reasons I've mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Okay, um, I don't know if Judith or Margaret was first, sorry. I don't, oh, I don't know. Well, I, I just want to put some perspective um, since I am the, pro I probably am the oldest person on this committee and I've been on it the longest. Um, and, and also just in terms of, you know, just my own personal experience with working with large projects that over time, new people come in, you know, new and new stakeholders and, you know, things, that you thought were fine get changed. And it's, you know, so I can certainly hear the frustration, um, you know, of our principals. And I'm really glad that you're here to, to, to address us. Um, when we first started talking about SMS projects, the priority was to get rid of the bungalows at all the schools, if, you know, most of the committee members remember that. You know, and we struggled with what we could do, you know, which schools that made sense to do, with, um, you know, in McKinley, that was that was the big deal as we, you know, we really put um, as a committee decided that we wanted to put, you know, a, a large chunk of the money into McKinley to remove the bungalows. And, you know, that's the purpose you know, of this building. I mean, my concern, but then, you know, but then, then you know, and, and as I can say oh, for, you know, I don't know how many years I've been on this, we really never looked at the historic um, impact, you know, the historic resources specifically of our campuses. You know, we made decisions, um, you know, based on the needs of the campuses, available fund, you know, lots of reasons. But, you know, we did make a commitment to, um, to really look at historic preservation for our, our school district. And, you know, I'm glad that we've done that um, at this point. And, you know, so we have the reports. And, and that is making us look at things differently. Um, you know, I don't know, I think that, you know, my concern with the building is that it just seems so massive in terms of, um, you know, how it refers to the historic buildings. And, you know, I'm looking at, at, at the site, I don't know, you know, with Rogers, it looks like you could potentially move things around. Um, you know, what, what uh, Dr. Benjamin said makes a lot of sense about the placement of this building. Um, in terms of the drop off, in terms of security, um, you know, it really reflects the needs of what the campus is. And so it's, you know, it's kind of, it puts us in as an advisory body, um, you know, it's, it's awkward to be, to say, well, we should stop and, you know, what, what can we do, you know, to address um, the historic impacts. And so I, you know, I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm just kind of you know, giving my perspective, um, you know, of, of our charge of the committee, um, you know, if, if the building could be made, um, you know, to, to fit in, you know, I would feel much more comfortable than, you know, what we're seeing now in terms of its bulk and, um, and so anyway, that's what I wanted to say. So I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to, how to move forward with McKinley, um, and it, it was good to hear Paul saying that they needed to address some of those issues. Ralph, do you want to speak? 
Sure. I mean, I, I, I tend to feel the same as, as Judith does. I mean, I'm, I don't really have a problem with the placement. I know some other others do, and it, it certainly, I, you know, can be looked at. But I, I'm not, for me, the, and look, let me back up and say, really, you know, the, the, the person who has to guide us in all this is our historical consultants. So as this moves forward, you know, um, the answer to um, this building being in this location, you know, will be confirmed or not. Um, I think it's okay. We're going to have a design subcommittee. I think that that will help a lot um, to go through, you know, sort of the refinement of, of the, the shape and, you know, the massing and, and the materials and how it all fits together. And that, you know, will also be part of the, I think the decision on uh, the impact this, this may or may not have. So uh, on, in that basis, I'm okay um, you know, with moving this, this ahead to the next step. So I'll just stop there. Okay, uh, Sam? Sam, you wanna speak? Yeah, so as, um, as, as a parent at McKinley, you know, I want to I want to speak from a few different perspectives. So, one I think um, that I, you know I heard from both of the principals, and I apologize for being late, uh, expressing some frustration um, and some concern with 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 issues that have been raised by the committee. And and I do think that you know part of the holistic picture of what's what what we as a committee have been looking at and have requested for for more than a year now is to really be able to deep dive. Um, options and not just have the same thing be presented over and over again. And so I think, you know, some of the frustration that you may be hearing uh, is, is with the, the approach that's been taken, which is kind of to continue down the path um, to get to things later on, such as the historical surveys, and, and then to get to a point where we're rushing into having conversations because another summer has gone by or another year has gone by. Uh, and obviously, you know, our children need spaces and they need much improved spaces. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, there are certainly, you know, concerns from a, from a usability perspective, you know, um, I, I would, I, I would, you know, suggest that, um, obviously having a, an improved drop-off is something that, you know, as someone who utilizes it daily and sees it, it's, it's a nice thing to have. Um, but there's also opportunities that that we're losing here. We are losing a big chunk of the yard itself. Um, I'd love to know the actual space increase count that's being called out. So, you know, parking has been floated that it'll allow for parking for staff as well as parents. And so we, we are losing the outdoor garden space in, in, in doing this. We are losing a big chunk of the outdoor space because we're crunching it in. And if we're going to sacrifice those spaces, which again, in order to create indoor learning space that that is much more multidimensional than these um, than the current standard is, that's vital, right? And and we all know that. The question I think, and and I floated this before, and I still have yet to see any other options, is where else on campus where we're not impacting the historical nature of the campus, there's the opportunity to create these spaces for our students um, because those do exist. Um, but what we see in phases one, two, and three is a significant shrinking of, of outdoor space, of gardening space, and of, again, not looking at kind of the full campus usage. So I do, and obviously Dr. Benjamin, you know, you and I know each other very well. Um, we are proud McKinley parents through and through, and, you know, we've already had one child finish and two more that are gonna be there for a long time. And so I think you know how important this is to us. Um, but I also think that, and I hope you understand that the reservations within this committee are not, uh, in terms of the educational need. I think we all understand the need for that. And, it, and I also think it's not just the historical piece. I, I do think the historical pieces are important. We all value that. And we've seen some of those things pass in the wayside. So it's, it's something we're sensitive to, but I also think we're sensitive to kind of best exploration. And in some ways, you know, I'll, I'll apologize because the schools are getting caught in the crosshairs of that while we've asked for those things and, and haven't been getting them. Um, so, but I, you know, certainly I'm appreciative, understand it, and, and we certainly need a solution that makes sense. I just think there are some hiccups here that, that need to continue to be explored. Could we um, put together a motion that somehow 
ties in the need for the design committee subcommittee re in involvement, as well as um, looking at the Secretary of the Interior standards. What keeps these things moving forward with the understanding that the subcommittee is going to be involved. I'm just trying to figure out how to also not slow down all these things. I mean, there's a lot, we all spent a lot of time looking at the program that was being proposed for these inside of these buildings. And I think we all recognize that the what's being proposed at each school is very important to the school. They really need it. They need, they need the inside. How now how the outside looks could be worked on. It hasn't been determined yet, but identifying what the students and the schools need was done and a lot of time was spent reviewing those proposals and trying to prioritize where we spent the money. Um, so we, this, that's still in the spirit of the, this. Now we just have to figure out how to move it forward in a way that also takes into consideration the historic resources and the looks of the schools. And I, that don't, I'm not wording this right. I just want to get people to talk about whether that's something that they feel comfortable with. Alexis? Yeah, I would. I think that's a good summary. And I, I remember when we were putting projects forward um, it was a, a year ago of, of what we wanted to move into SD. And this was a very important project that in all the different scenarios we looked at was a priority project. So I would hate to hold it up. I just think it needs I think we just have to stipulate that we want to I like the location of it. I don't have a problem with where it's on the campus. I think it's just about, you know, really being stringent on having more meetings to see how it's moved forward. And then as a whole, I think as part of these, I think it's really important that we continue as their massing is developed, that we're always simultaneously looking at a, an updated report of green space on campuses and how they're being impacted. Uh Oh, Thomas, are you agreeing or do you need to speak? I, I know your hand was up earlier. So. No, I, I hit the wrong one. Um, because there are obviously always priorities, right? And priorities are driven by money. I know we've talked a lot about design, what's important, but can we go back to the original part of the deck and see the SMS budget at some point? Because, you know, our last meeting, um, that number changed, I think it was almost 20% from what was presented to us from October. What's it? Everybody on this call is aware of inflation, but that's just astronomical. And so I think we're gonna to have to look at the, I just like to see that number because um, priorities are driven by money. <clears throat> and especially since we're supposed to be stewards of it, I think that's important. And, and by the way, has it changed from last week? I'm just curious. This is based on a schedule that we have it went from you know the 87 to 104 and it's uh you can you can look at it in the presentation and side by side which i think is most interesting um and it's based on you know a schedule that we have developed to move the projects forward so how so carrie the the deck that we got originally mm -hmm. it was 87 and then on the meeting we had last week correct it was 104. So I understand right. that you this might is, have this to is the eighty-seven. This was this was the numbers as of October twenty twenty-one. Right. And uh, and so, we can show. Jerry, you I think it's also it's actually isn't it October twenty twenty? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry, it is October twenty twenty. Yeah. So I mean, actually, it looks bad if it's only that many months and it changes that much. No. Yeah, but I mean, to Thomas's point, when you're looking at this, it looks like that's four months, right? Five, four months. Right. That's insane. But in fairness, that's a mistake. It was October 2020, which is when this committee was first yeah. starting to consider these, not 21. So thank you for pointing that out, Thomas. And that that's a that's something we'll fix on the on the slide deck here. But it's it's a full year of escalation that occurred prior to October 21, of course. It's almost 18 months of escalation. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's an important important fix. Yeah. And, and we're seeing about it's a year more than it looks like. Okay, I'll, I'll take the, I should, that, that should be revised to what was originally approved, October 20. So let's call it 18 months. So, I mean, I'm just doing ballpark math. That's a 20% increase. So- Yeah, it's about 1% a month compounded. Yeah. And, and that's it's, way more than inflation, but it's not way more than escalation that we're seeing on construction projects. I mean, it's, it, 
makes you feel sick, but we're seeing it on multiple projects. You know, we've talked about how we had to redesign a significant portion of uh, phase three at Samuel High for the very same reason. Mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunately, I don't know if it's, I guess industry wide, I don't know if it's worldwide is the right way to say that, but um, we're, we're seeing big cost increases still, still today. So if, if it is, let's just use round numbers, 88 to 107, was it? Is that going to require some reductions in scope at one of those schools, or are we is the school board going to proceed with that increase? I mean, as of it probably what was the direction to, today. Go ahead. Yeah, it's it's a great question. It's one of the things Carrie mentioned last week, but just to to clarify that, what it really means is pushing a project out. Now we happen to have Roosevelt, which is much more impacted by historical. Um, mm -hmm. um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, Analysis. The, the historic district, right. So Roosevelt is so much more impacted that when we looked at that, we said, okay, if we're going to really give this um, the, the credit that it's due, we, we've got to step back and, and look at Rose, Roosevelt again whole cloth. So what it really means is moving Roosevelt out of this group of projects, pushing it back to a, the next group of projects. Um, because I think, Carrie, if you – Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, if I'm not mistaken, that second slide, which shows it at 107, includes Roosevelt still, correct? Yeah, so what's it does include Roosevelt at $17 million. Yeah. Okay. So it pretty much is the number. Uh, but that does mean, you know, we're leaving kids in old portables at Roosevelt longer. Yeah. And we're not ready for TK there. So we're gonna Gary, I mean, with all, with all due respect, I mean, this argument, there's nobody on this committee who thinks children should be in bungalows. I mean, I haven't been on the committee as long as everybody, but if, if you really want to go back and give a litany of all the failures and incompetent and delays, we can do that. But I've heard the arguments, nobody's against puppies, nobody's against clean air, nobody's against great public education. Mm -hmm. So I just think we got to be careful when I start to hear these kind of um, conflated arguments about, you know, nobody's here trying to hold up public education. Everybody on this committee is a volunteer. We're not billing hours like most people on this call. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Judith? I just had, I have a question for Paul Travis, a, a clarifying question about McKinley. Because um, you, you know, you raised some, some concerns you know, that, that we all share about this, um, the design of this of the building, and so my question is, when um, when will that be addressed? I mean, so if you know, if we go forward with design development, when you know, in the CEQA process, I mean, how soon how soon will that be analyzed? Um, you know, uh, Judith, I'm not sure if that's a question for me or it might be for Julian. He's more the holder oh. of the schedule. Um, I can say, I can talk about, you know, typically what we would try to do is work, you know, with the design team to get a project that does hopefully meet the standards as we want it to. And then that would become the project that is analyzed, right? So that's typically how we do it, but I'm not really driving that, you know, on my end. But I mean, is that something that we, I mean, we could put into a, a condition of going forward with McKinley? I mean, because, I mean, it sounds to me that perhaps what is being presented, you know, would not be, you know, would not meet CEQA um, in terms of the historic um, uh, resource preservation portion. And so a lot of our concerns could, um, you know, could go away if, uh, if a, a project was designed that would meet that. Um, so, yeah. Lynn? Yeah, um, I, I can. I can help with this a little bit. So Thank you. <laughs> we we hired our CEQA consultants some time ago over uh, over the summer um, and they had started working. And then um, once the HRIs were released and the last meeting, we actually put them on hold because at the moment we don't have projects to design to to evaluate. Um, Paul would work with the architect. Um, once they get approval to design. He can't determine what potential impacts would be until he knows what the design is. And he can't make modifications to a schematic. 
So at this stage, nobody is evaluating anything. Now we can move forward with the projects that everybody likes, but we can't move forward with CEQA on projects that are not moving forward in design because it's you, you need to look at the whole of the action. Um, the other thing, and I am gonna say this, CEQA does not prevent you from having a significant impact. Oh, I know, I know. Okay, so as a board, the board can decide right. what, how they want to proceed. Um, and, and I have no skin in this game. I just want to say that, you know, um, in some cases, we have in the past taken significant and unavoidable impacts on our projects. We've done that in Malibu. We did that with Samo High. Not related to historic resources, but on other topics. The benefit of the project outweighed that significant impact. And that is something that the board will have to balance as they're moving forward. No, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, did you want to speak? Or that was uh, old. Put your hand up. <laughs> he just likes leaving his hand up. That's all. <laughs> okay. Um, it is uh, six o'clock. So. Um, well, birthday, Joan. So, we got to get. That I know, it's happened for a day. We we um, Joan, if I could reflect back to you what I think. I heard, and then maybe somebody could make them. I mean, you'll be your motion, whatever motion you guys make. But from staff's perspective, I think I heard you guys, I think I heard you, Joan, specifically say um, that you would recommend moving forward with these projects and kind of incorporating what others, Judith and, and uh, I think maybe it was Sam and my screen just moved around. Um, certainly Margaret said that the, the caveat would be that we develop and um, incorporate a, uh, a subcommittee, a design review subcommittee from this committee, uh, who would be meeting with our architects as well as, um, you know, the, the historic uh, resources consultants uh, as we go forward with design development. Um, and then to Judith's point, I don't know that this needs to be part of the motion because all of this has to go through CEQA anyway, Judith. So I, I, that. I don't think we need to caveat it by saying, and it will be reviewed, you know, as part of CEQA because the law tells us that it has to be. So I think we can just know that that's kind of built into it. But um, I, what what I think I was hearing was the committee trending towards um, a recommendation to move forward with design, with the caveat being development and inclusion of the uh, uh, subcommittee. We need to say anything like, about yeah, sector. Secretary of the Interior Standards or no? I mean, certainly you can say that. Um, the, the board policy already, I think, addresses that, but certainly you can make that part of the motion as well. But before we go forward, it looks like both Margaret and Sam have raised their hand to speak yeah. before, before a motion, I think. Uh, Margaret? Yes, thank you. I, um, is, is the goal to have a, a blanket motion for all, all of the proposed SMS projects or could uh, we handle them one by one? Because the each has, well, I would say maybe a couple of them have, uh, have wrinkles. And I, I think the two that I'm thinking about are Rogers and, um, yeah. and McKinley because um, I, I don't feel comfortable at this point um, supporting, um, the SMS projects without understanding uh, what the mass, how they fit into the master plan. So I would I would want to see the master plan confirmed or further developed uh, in tandem with the design development. So I can address the first part of that question. Um, we would prefer one motion for I mean one recommendation from the committee for all because there is one motion before the board. Uh, I'm sorry one item before the board to look at giving us direction to proceed with all. Um, but again, it's your committee. You, you guys get to make your motion. And Carrie, did well, you want to address this? Let's hear from the other committee members. I, I believe that um, Ralph had his hand up and then Sam. Okay. Uh, no, I'm happy to hear from Carrie at the moment. If you want to say something. Yeah. No, no. Before, before Carrie speaks, I'd actually, I had asked something last week 
Um, I'd asked about the breaking out of the finances for just the DD work. And if that could be spec to us and provided to us. And again, I apologize because I had a work thing I had to deal with. So if that was already discussed earlier in this meeting, but you know, I think I think part of the challenge with a with a whole singular recommendation is that again, we're moving down a pathway where we've already identified there's a significant spend issue. There's some challenges with historical, there's some challenges with master planning. Uh, and we're looking for approval. Yes, it's to move to the next phase, but again, it's it's an approval vote for the next phase of this larger scope of projects. And I think what the committee has asked for in the past, and again, I, I did ask for this last week, and I don't know if you guys have it, but was to break out because there is the opportunity to potentially suggest that the committee is aligned with moving forward with, you know, preparing the DD steps, which allow for conversations around master planning, CEQA, look, feel, et cetera, but don't have the commitment of $104 million worth of projects in an $87 million world. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think that, again, I understand, you know, what's been put in front of the board with what was noticed to the board, um, but it was noticed to the board with us already having part of this conversation last week where there was definite hesitancy around motioning everything. Um, and, and so, you know, I think there are opportunities to break these things out and, and do them sequentially and to frankly not slow down the train, but to be more uh, diplomatic and effective with resources. Um, you know, spending five to 10 million on DD and getting that approval now to get that path rolling and allow for some of these further conversations doesn't slow down the process, but allows us to um, have some further conversations that have been raised by a number of committee members tonight. Well, I mean, is it possible to include those conversations as part of the motion? I, I, um, Sam, what do you think? I mean, I, again, I, and I mean, the, the motion that I would suggest is I, I'm not inclined to make a motion to the board to move forward with the commitment to these projects. I think I'm inclined to move forward with not delaying them by moving forward with a with a DD process that's aligned with also um, clear master planning updates around Rogers and McKinley, as well as, you know, uh, the historical reviews that can be done in tandem with the DD work. Um, and again, that may be a commitment of $10 million, but to the concerns raised by the principals here, which again, I'm wholly aligned with, we're not slowing down the process. We're just being more diplomatic because again, we're going to have to come back as this committee and there needs to be a recommendation of which project or projects to cut out because the funds aren't there for all of them. And so why would we make a recommendation to the board to spend all of this money that we, we know isn't going to be there down the line? Well, but the, the request from the request from the staff is that we do make a recommendation to the board to move forward with these projects. So oh, just the design. It's to DD. Yeah. Only the five yeah. projects yeah. mentioned. It's only those five projects and just to DD. And, I mean, and the, just to be clear, the board has already approved the designer's yeah. contract to do that. What we, our commitment to, to the board was, we're gonna go through this process, we're gonna get through schematic design, we're gonna do the historic resources reports, and then we're gonna come back to you. This is coming back to them. We're not asking actually for the board to take action on the contracts because they've been approved. Um, we're asking the board to give us direction to move forward with design development phase of these projects, excluding Roosevelt. So that goes to Thomas's question before about like, you know, how come it's $104 million or 100 cent, whatever the number was. Um, we're removing Roosevelt primarily because of the historical um, district issues that we have there. But secondarily, we had to remove something because the costs have gone up so significantly. Does that get to what you're asking, Sam? And, and by the way, you're also right. It's probably in the five to $6 million range for design development uh, work that the architects would be doing combined. Yeah, so I mean, I, again, I think that what I haven't seen is is the clear list of the five with the costs associated. We're asking, being asked to make a recommendation to the board for. I, I guess that's again what what I still haven't seen. I, I saw a spreadsheet okay, that had, right. I saw a document yeah, that had right. more than five on it. Uh, I, but again, that, that I guess that's the basic question, right? Yeah. Um, can you put up the spreadsheet one more time, just so we can see it. Please. Okay, hang on a second. Um, 
second sheet. I know, just a moment. Okay, just to say, this is the recommendation that we're asking the board. And, you know, is it's recommended to, and we can amend what your recommendation is, and we can put this, but this was the recommendation that staff generated that proceed with the designs for the following projects. And it talks about each one. And then we also it's point also out recommended that the board provide direction to continue to develop the campus plans for the following projects. And that's what, that's the recommendation that's in the uh, board item at the moment. Now you can put up whatever you want to put in there, but that's what's what, what, what we currently have as a staff recommendation. And Sam, to be to your point of it being more than five projects, you're right, because these were individual projects. We consolidated them to the five campus projects. So, you know, Grant here shows three projects. We're talking about it as though it's one project because that's the way we'll build it. But it was three facilities, three improvements, whatever. So that that I think may explain why it's I keep saying five and you're saying well, there's more than five here. You're right. But that's the difference. And most of those are right. Okay, and Roosevelt disappears from that. So again, I guess, and I mean, Carrie, you're sitting at your computer, but hopefully you could simply delete a line and, and share your computer screen that shows what the actual total is that's outlined here. I mean, it's going to be 104,678 minus 17,569. He's, he's in uh, PowerPoint. It's not going to do the math. Yeah, in PowerPoint. PowerPoint, I can't do it in math, but I can do it on a computer. <laughs> We'll cover our sixteen million dollars. I mean, it's going to be eighty-six million. But the request is simply for five to six million of that towards this project, correct? The design. So we're down to eighty-seven one hundred nine four fifteen, which is back to the one oh back to the eighty-eight that we had to play with, and that still also includes a ten million contingency. But just to be clear, Sam, we don't need approval from the board for for that dollar amount. The board has already taken action and approved those contracts. And I, I guess I'm I'm. So what's the so if the contracts for the design are already approved, what is this? You're you're asking for approval for the board to move forward with design, but you just said they already approved the contracts. They've approved the dollar amounts of the contracts. Our commitment at the time was to go through this process before we moved on to DD. We've gone through the process. We'd like to move on to DD. And those DD contracts are already approved, correct? Yeah, the, the DD and uh, CD and uh, construction contracts. So it's the whole contract. He means construction administration, not construction. I know. No, I, I got it. I, I, I followed that. I know you have I couldn't get my initials together. I know. <laughs> Ralph, your hand's been up for a while. Do you have something to add? It's really tired. <laughs> and now Wendy, yeah. Wendy's has been up for an hour and a half. She's a sure. member of the public. I know that. <laughs> oh. But she, has, she also has a fit in for public comment, right. John, just so you know. I'm just saying. Um, so, I mean, I'm a, if the motion is, you know, to um, recommend to the board that they move ahead with, that they, uh, that move ahead with the design development portion of the project. I'm fine with that. Um, the only, rather worse, the only one that I, I mean, I know that, you know, for Grant, uh, what, I've, what we've been told is that in the spring or the fall, somewhere between late spring and, and early fall, you know, they all will come back with the, with the historic analysis being complete. So we will know if the future phases of Grant um, can remain as they are, or there might be modifications. Same with, you know, Franklin, um, all of them. Um, the only one that I would like to take a look at now, because if there is another way to just sort of move, put the pieces on Rogers, we should do it now um, and not have to live with something later on. That's, and, and McKinley, I don't really feel the same way. I think that's more, you know, sort of a design compatibility issue. Um, so I have confidence. So for me, it's really just taking, as somebody said, you know, take two weeks um, and have us and, and look at, you know, look at Rogers again, because we've made a, a decision 
a major decision about what the the future is going to you know, be on that site. So it's an opportunity, and I want to pass by that opportunity. Um, anyway, that's kind of where I stand, and that, that would be clear that that we're just going to do that. I think Margaret was next. Yeah, I would. I would just um, um, add to um, to Ralph's comment. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about the motion now, and if we're really moving towards a motion that in incorporates all five of these projects or all five of the campuses, I would um, have. I would add to the motion that that uh, in addition to, and I'm just looking at the. Um, the wording, uh, if it says provide pr uh, provide direction to proceed with the designs for the following projects, um, I would want to add and to confirm um, master plan uh, master plans for um, for Rogers and McKinley simultaneously. Good. Mary, can you put up that language in the slide, please? So when she's talking, it's easier for us to follow. Please. Uh, you want me to type the language that she's saying? Well, actually, I, I think that's a great idea, um, but he wanted to see it. But I think th if we can type this in a way that everybody, um, it might be on that page before this one, Carrie. Okay. So th 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 this is fine. The next page where you say it is also recommended? Yes. We might have another one that says it is also recommended that the, you know, I, I'm going to have a hard time exactly um, reiterating what you said, Margaret, but I think what we're going to say is that we would want the design review. A, we would create a design review committee, subcommittee from this, um, uh, this committee, and that that subcommittee would not only be involved with the review of the phase one design development, uh, projects, but also at McKinley and Grant, nope, McKinley and Rogers. Um, I, I, tell me how you said it, Bar Margaret. It was better than I could. Oh, I don't know. I, <laughs> let's rewind the recording. Um, um, to um, I think you confirm, said confirm, confirm, um, review and confirm um, the master plan. Master plan for uh, the Rogers and McKinley campuses. Um, so after put instead of and at put and review and confirm. Yeah. I think we call them campus plans, Carrie. A lot of pressure with everybody watching you type. Uh -huh. And I, I suck don't. at typing. So really, the question is: is that is that the uh, is that the purview of the design review subcommittee to review the, the campus plans, or does it have to go back to come back to the entire FDAC? Well, well I, I feel mean, like I I feel like the campus plans want to get a a connection by the uh, uh, design review committee, hopefully. <laughs> in the next two weeks, uh, because then what I would want to do is at the community meetings, we would present those to the people who show up at the community meetings, get their input. Uh, and so that that allows us then to come back to you all again after the community meetings uh, in mid-March and take a look at where we are with the process. And if you feel like we're still on the right track, you know, or certainly depending on what the board gives us for direction, you know, but uh, you know, if we're on the right track, then, you know, they would say so. I, I would, I would be more comfortable with flipping the um, design review subcommittee uh, task that will review and confirm the McKinley and Rogers campus plans and, um, and, and, and then review um, the phase one design development projects. I mean, it, it, it certainly to me makes sense that, yeah. that we're, we're much better equipped to 
uh, review the um, design development for those two campuses once the master plan placements are confirmed. I was thinking it might be done in, you know, in parallel, and but I well, think you're logically this makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope so too. I mean, it seems like we're we're getting we're getting closer, and um, there's certainly I think I share um, the uh, the sense of urgency. I'm a newcomer on the committee, but I I, I can appreciate how uh, frustrating it could be to to see um, plans, you know. Um, extended and projects extended to the future indefinitely. So, Joan, if I can, so I think it's important to, to remind ourselves um, we're an advisory committee, which is different right. than, than, than other, other committees. Um, and that, and I think actually Carrie, you know, said it the right way in, in terms of, you know, we can look at it, but if there are any changes, it, it, if it's going to be look, looked at by the the school sites and the community as the, you know they have to we don't get to make this decision right we Good are point. we are advisory mm -hmm. let me clarify the the concerns around and again uh, you know coming in a little late the concerns around rogers and mckinley are those historical resource related for the campus as a whole or just master plan as a whole both uh, both, both. Right. So then, uh, so then, what I will call out is that the the notice that was provided in the board meeting would have to be changed drastically because the first call out is that based on the analysis of these reports, it's been determined that the projects at Franklin, Rogers, and McKinley will not impact any potential historical resources on the campus. And with two of those I mean, three campuses, anyone... we're not questioning that. Sorry, Sam. I don't think anyone's actually questioning whether the Phase One projects will. I think their concern was, you know, it, it, for example, the existence of a phase one project at uh, Rogers isn't going to impact the historical um, district there, but you could make it where it's incompatible with it. it could, and so that's an aesthetic issue more than anything else. The other aesthetic issue there was, I think Margaret was pointing out that, or maybe it was Alexis, I'm sorry, someone pointed out that it seemed like a hard building, like a very um, unwelcoming building which it, it doesn't, you know, detract from the historical district that exists, but it's still something we need to look at. Uh, but I, I don't think any of the phase one projects, and Margaret, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we were concerned that the phase one projects would um, be detrimental to the existence of historical districts, would we? I, no, I think that the, the question is maybe most urgent with, with McKinley and, and maybe it's a, a maybe it's simply a design compatibility issue. I don't know. I don't know the projects that well. I don't know the campuses that well. So I I'm I, I, I want to just indicate that, you know, I, I'm a little bit handicapped. I'm really looking forward to the um, the campus tours and community meetings. I think those are going to be very, very helpful. Um, in, in moving, you know, the, the design and, and, and sort of master plan issues on those two campuses uh, forward. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Is this, uh, can we accept this as a motion? But, a yeah, I think someone would need to make the motion. Uh, I'll make it a motion and then, uh, or Judas can make it a motion and Judas second or one of us can be one and you can- Whichever you prefer, which you prefer. I, I move the motion in front of us on the screen. I'll second, or am I allowed to vote? Um, sure, the chair can second something, sure. Okay, um, can we, do we have any further discussion or can we vote on this? So uh, again, I, I'm gonna kind of point back to what was already noticed to the board is that this is not in line with that. So I just, I don't know how that plays or, or what that piece of the puzzle is, but you know, it, it's not in line with what's been fully written out and noticed to the board. Now, again, at the end, it just says this information has been reviewed by the FDAC. So, you know, does this motion even, you know, where, are we attaching that to the bottom of this point or, or kind of how is that being approached? But it's, it's not in line with what's currently typed in there. Can you go, um, John, could you go back to the, the page before with the beginning of it? You know, the first. So I'm pretty sure, I mean, Steve and Carrie chime in. I mean, the, the, what's going to the board, this is what they're going to vote on. 
Carrie and Steve are just going to say that the FDAC, as their role as an advisory committee, met extensively, we should say, don't forget to say extensively, <laughs> to review and discuss this whole thing. And as a result, we recommend moving forward with the motion that is currently before the board and then adding the language that we just added. Um, but or, and, and with the recommend, it's not even adding the language, it's like recommendation that they do these things or they recommend, request these things. Carrie, right? Carrie, the word extensively wasn't supposed to go there. It was supposed to say that. Oh, no, no, it's just when you're talking, just when you're talking. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. No, I, like, I just, I think my only comment is that this is not, in some ways, it's, it's a sort of awkwardly um, sequenced, um, how should I put it, an awkwardly sequenced motion. Um, because I, I, I still feel that we're sort of missing the, the sequential nature of this evaluation, that design development can't really happen, particularly on two campuses, um, until there's a confirmation of uh, a review and confirmation of the master plan. So, so that's, that's kind of where I'm, I, I'm a little bit troubled. I mean, the, the substance of the, of the motion seems well-intentioned and, and correct, but it's it's expressed in a way that I think maybe isn't the most appropriate. Well, I mean, really to what you're saying, Margaret, you're trying to, if I believe I understand it, really McKinley and Rogers should be rolled up into the second part of the motion and removed from the first part of the motion. Because the, the DD phase, if, if the request is that we're doing campus plan review before the DD phase, mm -hmm. this would not be simultaneous to, to what Steve had pointed out, trying to do simultaneously. Well, that, that may be, that may be a, a good suggestion, another way to structure the motion. I just, um, I, I, just I think to smooth this process along, I think you're right, Sam, we should separate into two motions because I think we can all relatively quickly uh, agree with moving forward um, all the schools except for McKinley and Rogers. Yeah, so I mean, I think you could say that we recommend um, moving forward um, with design development for JAMS, Grant, and Franklin, um, and then and then that the, that we also recommend the creation of a design review subcommittee. Um, <sighs> that um, will review, confirm, uh, well, I think that the- uh, <clears throat> Can we just wait, let's just yeah, do that first, let's just do that. Can we just, sorry, Judith, can we just do that first motion? Sure. Someone second and we can vote on that. Okay. You're done. Okay, so could, who second that, Margaret? So the first one is, is on the just three. We recommend moving forward with design development on- um, I'm yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Joan, I, I, you have a motion on the table right now. Oh, okay, so oh, I guess we have to it either needs to be withdrawn or replaced uh, or voted down or voted up. I, I, withdraw withdraw that that I withdraw the first motion. Yeah. So now we have Judith's um, second motion, and it was seconded by Margaret, correct? No, I didn't second it. I think it was. Okay, I'll, I'll second it. It's this one that Carrie just typed FDAC recommends moving forward with the next phase of design on the Grant, Franklin, and Adams SMS projects. Okay, that motion has been, uh, that's been put forward and seconded by me, put forward by Judith. Can we vote on that? Or do we need any discussion on just that one, just that one? Okay, I'm gonna call for a vote. Um, all those members in favor of accepting just that one motion, raise your hand. Okay, uh, any opposed and any, Ralph opposed? No, okay, any abstentions? Okay, now the next one. I think the next one should be the um, creation of a design review subcommittee. As so you don't need board approval to do that. Okay. Uh, so that, that's something, I mean, we'll all work with Joan on it, but we can, the, the subcommittee, this committee can create an ad hoc subcommittee on its own. We just want you to, to explain to the board when you're talking about this, that we are doing that just so that they're, they know the process yeah, no that problem. we're going through. So do we need a motion to um, create that committee now? No. 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 But it's just for information for the board. Now we just need to figure out the motion that's going to be specific to McKinley 
and Rogers. So how are we well, going to- I, I think you're taking the top portion of what's up there. Right. And you're basically, you know, you're adding McKinley and Rogers to that. I, I do think that that we, you know- I'm not doing that, Sam. No, that, no. Yeah, we're 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 asking we're asking that the the there's continued development of the campus plans. That's what no, we're asking for. Not quite. Roosevelt and Lincoln are are do need to go back and fully reconsider their math their plans. We just want to review. What we're what we're doing is really changing the I think the second bullet. The FDAC recommends moving forward with the next phases of the design on the Rogers and McKinley pro, SMS projects. Um, including or providing that, uh, including providing um, a confirmation that the current placement of the buildings is not detrimental um, to the historic fabric of the campuses, something like that. It's not going back and, and necessarily, I mean, if there's, if, if it comes out in the short term that there is an issue, then there would be further, there might be some changes to the master plan, but it's not saying, the whole best, you know, at Rogers and Lincoln, it's start. It's basically reevaluating um, the placement of everything because of the historic study. The historic studies that we have don't say that about Rogers and McKinley. We're asking the question. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. What did I say? You got to keep what going. Was the there. last part of okay. that, Ralph. I'm sorry. What was the last part of that? I, I was just saying that. So it's um, the FTC, rec oh, I see, recommends moving forward to the next phases of the sign McKinley and, and um, including. Or you could say subject to confirmation. Or subject to or provided that. Yeah, subject to confirmation of. Um, uh, placement of the proposed uh, phase one additions. Well, uh, but, why, but why, not, why not broaden that language a little bit to say, um, in, in the context of the master plan. I mean, I think- Yeah, I like that, in the context of the master plan. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's inherent, in it, but that's fine. But it's-, it's Campus it's not, plans, campus it's not plans. putting them on the slow boat. No, or, uh, no? So I have to review of uh, the SMS projects in context or something in context with the, with the, with the campus plans. Okay, I see what you're saying, Carrie. I think that worked. Oh, subject to review of campus plans and. What do you guys think? Of right. So, as it currently reads, the FDAC recommends moving forward with the next phases of the design on the McKinley and Rogers SMS project subject to a review of the campus plans in context with historic resources reports. Does that work? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, that's. Um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll make that motion then that I just read. Somebody second it. I'll second it. Uh, any discussion? Okay. Um, I'll take a vote. All those in favor uh, of accepting the motion as proposed or read? Alexis, or all those opposed? Oh, okay. All those opposed? Uh, any abstentions? Okay. So, Joan, what was the vote? It, 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 yeah, we couldn't see. Oh, oh, you can't see. Oh, everybody voted. Can't see everybody. <laughs> well, the members. The members. Members. We can't. Okay, see we have, we pa it passed. Oh, what was it? What was by? Ha what was it? The number? I mean, because we we're we, all we can see is the slideshow and you. Oh, so we can't see who voted. So we had so, the seven members that are here voted to move it forward, for both of them. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry, okay. I didn't. I didn't realize you couldn't see that. Sorry. Uh, they're, they're probably just set up to view the speaker and the and the. Oh, slideshow. okay. Sorry. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, can, I, can I just say, um, so just to, in somewhat, you know, to what other eight members, sorry, eight about uh, financial issues is that this is design development. All this comes back at the end of design development before it moves into uh, the construction documents. 
we'll, we'll have another look, you know, and we'll have updated numbers and we'll know whether all the projects, you know, can move ahead or, you know, whether there's financial issues and there might have to be some, you know, uh, tiering and, and changes of, of what moves to the next level. So I just, you know, because we've had discussions about whether we, if we know there's inflation, but we don't know what's, you know, six months from now, we, we don't know what the situation is going to be. We can hope it's good. No. Let's just hope it's better. We've, we've included, <laughs> right, we've included, uh, you know, an estimate of escalation, but you're right, Ralph, we don't. And honestly, we last year thought we were being conservative and we were wrong. We were not conservative. Trust me, I do this every day. I want it to be better. <laughs> Steve, what do you what do you have in for the escalation? I'm just curious. Uh, I think we're I think we're we've carried one percent recently, and I think we're looking at a half percent per month going forward. Which you know, I mean, it's compounded, but it's around six percent per year, um, which historically would not be it would not be low. Um, you know, it might be a conservative number historically, but in the last two years, year and a half. Um, numbers have been crazy. And, and it, it varies based on the type of material. I mean, I think we've talked about it before. We saw a 300% increase in, in the cost of steel decking. It's bizarre. But um, anyway, so, you know, we, we average, I think we're, we're holding 1%, I'm sorry, half percent per month going forward. I apologize. Um, I, I, I have to go. Daughter's taking me out to dinner and they're going to kill me. So I got to go. Happy birthday. Thank you. I, okay. Before you, before you do, Joan, I, oh. I, I'm assuming you're going to turn the meeting over to someone else to run. Yes, yeah. Sam is the co-chair or the we can, vice chair. That's great. We can put off the project updates and discussion if you'd like, but you do have a public speaker, and I would strongly recommend to the committee that we at least allow the public speaker to speak tonight, even if we put off the project updates. Yeah. Oh, good idea. Good idea. So are you turning it over to Sam to run? Yes, to go celebrate Sam. Your birthday? Yeah, bye, Sam. Bye. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Joan. Thank you. Do we need to make the recommendations around the, um, what was it, the Roosevelt, or is that already taken care of, the third piece? We're actually not asking the board to move forward with, um, we're not moving forward with design on those, so I don't think we have a request to the board. Am I wrong, Kerry? The, the request to the board is just that we continue the master planning process and, you know, it's it's that we're not completed. You know, we have to go back and review Roosevelt based on the historical resources information. And Lincoln, we had never really completed the master plan there. We had two plans that were in conflict. And now we feel like we have a good plan, but we want to take both of those back to the community. Uh, and we have time scheduled, uh, or we're scheduling time to do that at the end of the month, end of March. So, Carrie, to Sam's point, mm -hmm. if we're asking the, the board, for direction to move forward with DD on these other projects, should we not also ask them for direction to step backwards on Roosevelt? That is exactly the direction we're asking. That's what was on the slide. Yeah. So we should, so again, to Sam's point, we should get a recommend uh, a motion and recommendation from the committee to do that. I would think. Sure. Is that what you're getting at, Sam? Yeah, I didn't think. I think we didn't cover that one, right? We didn't leave that attached to any of the other two, so. Just want to make sure you guys have what you need. So, so we're looking for we're looking for a motion to recommend uh, revisit or um, continuation of the Roosevelt and Lincoln planning and not moving forward with DD at this time. Is that correct? There it is. I'll move, I'll move it. We have a second. I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. I guess I should view the whole gallery now that I'm in charge. Hold on. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I've been doing you my, I've been using, I've been using hands. I got a thumbs up for Amy. I got Margaret with an eye. Thomas gave me a thumbs up. All right. Thank you. Ralph, Margaret. I think we're good. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So um, that'll move us on from item number three, Sam, to item number four, which is project updates and discussions. I know we've gone long. We were supposed to try to end at six. Do you want to um, hear those tonight or do you want to put this off and we'll schedule another meeting? Um, I guess my question would be to the rest of the committee. I mean, it's already been two and a half hours. I would assume we'll put them off for now unless anyone really wants to hear them tonight and we can allow for the public comment that we still have. 
everyone aligned with that from the committee? Judith, you're muted. Yeah. Battery here. I'm going to turn off in a minute. Yeah, let's put it off. All right. We'll, we'll postpone that to the next meeting, Steve. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Sam, so that brings us to public comments. Um, we have, I've received one request for uh, public comments from Wendy Dembo. Um, and Wendy uh, will have three minutes to speak. And you can begin when you're ready and I'll start the timer and let you know. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm, my name is Wendy Dembo and I'm a parent of a current student at Lincoln who went to Franklin. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of getting rid of the portables and also redoing the bathrooms. Um, my friend went to Lincoln in the 80s. She said that they had the same bathrooms then and there were less students by almost, well, I guess now when our kids were there, there were more kids, but there's been a huge attrition recently. So um, there are less kids, but there's still the same bathrooms that were there in the 80s. And, um, but there are more classes and all those portables are new. So there's less space. The kids at, um, I just want to say that um, I went and got my daughter vaccinated at JAMS and was just amazed at how much outdoor space JAMS has as compared to Lincoln. Um, it's just, I don't know if you people have been to the campuses recently and just looked at the amount of outdoor space. My daughter um, at Franklin sat on the ground to eat lunch and she still does that at Lincoln because there just aren't enough tables or areas for children to eat. So um, I just want to make sure that when you're doing all these, you think about where children are able to eat and sit. Actually at Lincoln, they have to do lunch in um, two shifts. And so they have home base where my daughter plays cards basically because there's not enough room for all the kids to eat at the same time. Um, so anyway, just as a parent, I just wanna reiterate the importance of getting rid of the portables um, and upgrading the bathrooms because they are disgusting. My daughter actually doesn't use the bathroom at school. So, um, which I don't know if that's really a, a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing. Um, and what else? I wanted to mention that the showers at the new Samo pool don't drain. So that's just something I, I would, I, I guess my other concern is if, would you please use technology that has been tried and true as opposed to the new technology that um, like Edison, because you end up spending a lot of money of the taxpayer's money on um, new technology that doesn't always work. And it seems that you could spend less money and have more projects that would get rid of more portables. Um, so anyway, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Whatever you do, please focus on the portables. So thanks so much for all you do. Have a great evening. Well, Wendy, thank you. You nailed three minutes. Good job. And thank you for sitting through two hours and 39 minutes before your three minutes, Wendy. We do, we do appreciate that and recognize that. So thank you. Um, and, and I do think, uh, as you heard from many of us tonight, uh, there's an, uh, you know, there's an inordinate amount of, of understanding of some of the challenges, a lot of the challenges and opportunities. Um, we want to help find ways to improve them and make sure we're we're doing things in the right way. So, um, and again, I think uh, everyone sitting here has, you know, direct experience with our schools and wants to continue to see them grow and improve. So thank you. All right, uh, with that, the next on our list is uh, future meetings. We have anything set, Steve, or do we wanna try to figure out something now? I see, no, I, see I, mean, I, I see two people on the call that have their hands up. Are they, are they, um start a public comment? Uh, the only public comment request I got was from Wendy Dembo, plus obviously earlier Nina and Ruth Ann. Okay, because uh, I see I see two hands up, that's all. Am I allowed to just ask what um, are, 
are all the images that we saw today, are they gonna be posted for the public to see prior to it going to the board? Yes, how it, how yes. They are, okay. The public does have a chance to review. Yeah. On the presentation, because of this delay of, of this meeting, I, I have not posted the presentation, but I've just updated it and it's ready to go with your recommendation. So Sarah will post it first thing in the morning. And we're not able to hear their comments today. What's that? We're not able to hear the public comments for the other speakers today. Uh, I, I mean, how like I said, I got it's a decision of the chair. Uh, I mean, Sam, do you see there's two individuals in the upper typically left? Typically, they, you know. Well, how, what is the process for requesting public comment? Because the only in the in the chat, I chatted with Carrie Upton and um, with Joan Krenick, so I don't know what the process is to request public comment. Okay, so so we're in. This our... is Nikki Kolhoff. I also have asked to speak, and there aren't any instructions on how to do that. And okay, given there, we're here, there, we should be able there. to speak. There okay, are instructions on. on the web page uh, of, of how to do on this. On the agenda. On the agenda. And um, but Sam, if, if Sam would like to allow the speakers, we could certainly do that. Sam is. Uh, yeah, we're going to allow the speakers. So yeah, I agree. We'll, Let them speak. We're going to we're going to allow both Nikki and Kat to speak. So um, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. I don't know which of you has been here the longest, okay. but. Um, <laughs> They're just that they have some more public comments. By God, how it long it took them to craft it. Hey, Nikki, you're not muted. <laughs> oh no, that's Ingrid. I don't know who Ingrid oh, is. Oh, Ingrid, but... you're not muted. We appreciate the honesty, Ingrid. So um, with that, we're still with we're still underneath our our 20 minute uh, public comment phase. So we'll we'll let Kat and Nikki speak uh, and we'll go in or alphabetical order. Uh, Kat, first and last name both win. So uh, Kat, you'll have three minutes and uh, Steve, you'll, you'll time, correct? Thank sure. you so much, yes. And I know everybody is eager to um, get off this long meeting. So I really appreciate um, you accepting public comments. I'm not on camera because I'm dancing between getting my six-year-old bathed and fed and my 11-year-old as well. Um, my comment is a concern on the amount of focus on pre-kindergarten, so the pre-K to 12 um, focus on the development within our elementary schools. Uh, we're not seeing that in our demographics of um, Santa Monica in terms of how, how are we going to fill those classrooms and cram more children onto cramped campuses and take away green space and take away play space. Um, I, I am probably the draw of the 16K tuition for pre-K is um, a big factor there, but we really should be focusing on our K to 12, on lowering class sizes, and creating our schools and our campuses that accommodate that. Um, you know, will will the the will the pre K or the pre K to twelve initiatives will our current kindergarten to twelve be forced to subsidize the initiative before that gets all sorted out for them? Because sort of seems that way. Um, and then the, the maker spaces, I know there's a lot of uh, ambiguity about what this maker spaces actually are. And this sort of feels a little bit like the Samo High um, development in creating spaces that are able to be rented out to bring in additional money and aren't actually serving um, our community which is sort of the same with the preschool. Are we permitting in children? Is that how it's gonna work? Uh, I don't think that Santa Monica taxpayers are gonna love that um, and nor does it build our community. I really appreciate you giving me the chance to um, voice those comments and I thank you for all your work. Thank you very much, Kat. So we're not just to respond to public comment, but Kat, if you want to connect with me, I will I will let you know what's happening. The transition, the change with universal universal transition transitional kindergarten, and how okay. that's going to impact early childhood in our in our school district. Will do. Thank you.
Thank you, Kat. Appreciate you again sticking around and taking the time. And uh, Nikki, now we'll open the floor to you uh, as well. You'll have three minutes from when you begin. Great, thanks. Um, I was in the car driving home from downtown LA. So did you postpone all the phase three updates? Uh, yeah. yeah. The, the, I mean, we've gone over time. So uh, Sam asked that we put off all of the project updates. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to comment on those, but I guess, can I comment on those still? Yeah, of course, you can definitely oh, comment. Talk about whatever you want. Yes, Nikki, uh, you can this comment on those. And I think it would be great because we will take the minutes and have them at the next meeting. And so okay. it'll give okay. us some insight in, in our conversation that I'm sure we will have at the next meeting. So uh, yes, please, please feel free. And we'll restart your three minutes now. Thank so. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I do agree with the, the prior speakers um, regarding the campus plans. I'm kind of disappointed that any of this moved forward today because the communities are not in of these various schools are not in support of these plans because they do not eliminate the bungalows and replace them with two story buildings in order to create more space. They do not um, need maker spaces. Nobody wants those. Um, the pre-K is a concern, uh, even if you have to accommodate that somehow, it doesn't have to be using up all the space on our elementary schools. With respect to cost escalation, I don't understand why you're not surprised when you pass a bond and then you decide what to build. Obviously, prices are going to go up in the meantime. That's why responsible school districts plan a project and then they pass a bond specifically for that project, like Manhattan Beach's gym that was bonded for 39 million and spent 39 million. So we do it backwards, which is why we run out of money and don't finish any good plans. We don't have any master plans and we shouldn't be moving forward with projects before that or without the historic resources um, report being finalized. So phase three, it really needs to stop and be redesigned. So two issues here, one, I don't know if Carrie Upton gave it to you, but there was a brain spaces report from June 2020 that said we had declining enrollment and didn't need an entire classroom building. We don't need the exploration building. We should have just torn down language and replaced it there. And then the next building that we're doing is the library and the history building absolutely could have been repurposed into a library. So we are building a building that Carrie knew and the school board knew was not necessary to build because of declining enrollment. Switching to the gym, uh, Carrie will claim that this is a longstanding plan to have a campus uh, practice gym first. But this is, mind you, in a phase three where the other building didn't even exist in the same campus plan that Carrie Upton says that we are wedded to. So we shouldn't be building a practice gym. We should be building a gym that seats spectators like Manhattan Beach did. They have three courts side by side and the bleachers, trying to do this on my little screen, the bleachers come in from two sides so that there's full seating for the center court when there's a big game. They seat 2,200 people. Carrie's glass design that is totally impractical from that standpoint also has only two little courts when they're this way and one court this way with seating for fewer people than the current North gym has. Carrie's telling people that's okay, we can wait until we build the second gym to have spectator season seating. That's ridiculous because we should just build it now in the same footprint if we just didn't do the step up, we could build three courts side by side. You guys need to press pause on this so that we don't waste $85 million on a gym with no seating. Please, I'm begging you to redo it and look like Miracosta. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. Appreciate, uh, again, your public comments as well. And as I mentioned, they do go into the minutes and they will be part of the discussions that we have. Um, you know, I, we are still gonna have those updates. We're gonna schedule a time to do those. And I do think that, you know, the feedback that, that you've provided as well as others tonight and things that we've heard around the community, you know, the continue these conversations. We certainly don't take the recommendations lightly. I think, you know, we are, you know, we, we do continue to explore things and we'll continue to do so as we move forward and make our recommendations to the board. So thank you all. And with that, I'm gonna close public comments at this time uh, and we'll move forward to the next piece, which is scheduling uh, another meeting, which, Again, yeah, because we've had so, to postpone those comments, I would like to make that sooner rather than later. 
We can. I mean, I, I think our intent was to come back um, after the uh, next round of community meetings so that we could provide, and, and actually I'd also like to say, I would like for you uh, members to attend as many of those meetings as you can. I know it's a burden and I don't expect anybody to attend all of them, but I'd like you to hear the input that we get from, from the school community. So if you can, um, it'd be great to have you at those. And uh, our intent was to have the next FDAC meeting after the conclusion of those meetings um, so that we could kind of wrap back in uh, with you as we, as we move forward. Um, but so it does I recommend mean, March 14th. So I, I, so by March 14th, you're going to have all five of these community meetings completed. Is that, yes. is that correct? They're scheduled yeah. for February 28th, March 1st, March 8th, 9th, and 10th. What about phase three that you're spending more money on tomorrow? There's been no meeting about that. We've had plenty of meetings about phase three. It is proceeding apace. So uh, what, we're, what, I, what I'd like to understand though is, is that, so four days after the public meetings are complete or the community meetings as you're outlining them, you're gonna have detailed summaries kind of written out that we can go through and talk through all five of them or, or does it make sense to schedule a meeting and actually do these things systematically and actually read what the comments are. Because as someone who has read the comments regularly, I, I will say that, you know, the number of attendees are very limited at these meetings and the comments aren't always completely shared in these conversations that we have. So what I would recommend, Carrie, is that we actually plan on having two meetings to address these things, okay. um, to be able to properly address them. When do you want them? So, I'll, I'll look to the committee. I think we should be targeting two Mondays that, that we'll be able to cover this during. So I would like to be able to understand though when you will have summaries available for us to read. So my, my recommendation would be that we do something March 7th so we can go through the updates that we've talked about here tonight that we have had to postpone again and be able to look at some of the public commentary around the meetings on the 28th and the 1st and then potentially the 21st or the 28th to be able to review the other comments as well in the community and have kind of full discussions around them. Uh, we cannot do the seventh and then have community meetings on the eighth, ninth, and 10th. Um, perhaps we can spread out the community ask, meetings. I can't ask my staff to do that. So perhaps we can spread out the community meetings so they're not the three days in a row. The community meetings are already, they're already, they're already, already scheduled and already published. Scheduled. I mean, this wasn't well, you're scheduling and publishing community it. meetings before approvals are even done. I, Again, yeah, that's right. we've spoken to the backward nature of a lot of this planning. So this is not new to this committee or to the staff. Sam, we're just scheduling meetings and, and giving as much notice to the community as we can. Without yet having the recommendation or approval though. So again, you're, you're locking in, not communicating with our committee because you schedule community meetings without yet having the, move, the approval to move forward until tonight or actually until Thursday. So... You know, it's the same conversations we've had for two years now. There's the lack of listening from the staff here. So um, I've requested when those meetings should be. If you want to propose other dates, please feel free. And then the, the board here, the committee here can vote on those. If you'd like to come in on the Bye. 14th and do updates at that time on the 21st, we could come back the next week and we could do uh, we unfortunately asking us to volunteer to do two weeks in a row is not acceptable. So let's try other dates. Okay. 14th and 28th then. Great. Let's put them on the calendar, please. But, but Sam, it's, let's ask the questions. I mean, some of us could do two in a row. If that's for the case. You know, it just depends on what the dates are. Um, So will you send out, uh, you just sent out, Steve or Carrie, you, just, you sent out the, the notice of the committee meeting. Will you send that again just to the committee so that we all have those dates? Okay. I can't remember where it is. In we have a flyer, but I, I've got the dates. 